pulling a lip between his teeth, and he's fumbling behind his back to switch on a lamp, and he's thinking, I like this person. They break apart, and when Alex opens his eyes, Henry is watching him. Are you sure you don't want to talk about it? Alex groans. The thing is, he does, and Henry knows this too. It's, Alex starts. He paces backward, hands on his hips. He was supposed to be me in 20 years, you know? I was 15 the first time I met him, and I was in awe. He was everything I wanted to be, and he cared about people and about doing the work because it was the right thing to do, because we were making people's lives better. In the low light of the single lamp, Alex turns and sits down on the edge of the bed. I've never been more sure that I wanted to go into politics than when I went to Denver. I saw this young, queer guy who looked like me, sleeping at his desk because he wants kids at public schools in his state to have free lunches. And I was like, I could do this. I honestly don't know if I'm good enough or smart enough to ever be either of my parents. But I could be that. He drops his head down. He's never said the last part out loud to anyone before. And now, I'm sitting here thinking, that son of a bitch sold out. So maybe it's all bullshit. And maybe I really am just a naive kid who believes in magical shit that doesn't happen in real life. Henry comes to stand in front of Alex, his thigh brushing against the inside of Alex's knee, and he reaches one hand down to still Alex's nervous fidgeting. Someone else's choice doesn't change who you are. I feel like it does, Alex tells him. I wanted to believe in some people being good and doing this job because they want to do good doing the right things most of the time, and most things for the right reasons. I wanted to be the out loud to anyone before. And now, I'm sitting here thinking, that son of a bitch sold out. So maybe it's all bullshit. And maybe I really am just a naive kid who believes in magical shit that doesn't happen in real life. Henry comes to stand in front of Alex, his thigh brushing against the inside of Alex's knee, and he reaches one hand down to still Alex's nervous fidgeting. Someone else's choice doesn't change who you are. I feel like it does, Alex tells him. I wanted to believe in some people being good and doing this job because they want to do good. Doing the right things most of the time, and most things for the right reasons. I wanted to be the kind of person who believes in that. Henry's hands move, brushing up to Alex's shoulders, the tip of his throat, the underside of his jaw. And when Alex finally looks up, Henry's eyes are soft and steady. You still are, because you still bloody care so much. He leans down and presses a kiss into Alex's hair. And you are good. Most things are awful most of the time. But you're good. Alex takes a breath. There's this way Henry has of listening to the erratic stream of consciousness that pours out of Alex's mouth and answering with the clearest, crystallized truth that Alex has been trying to arrive at all along. If Alex's head is a storm, Henry is the place lightning hits ground. He wants it to be true. He lets Henry push him backward on the bed and kiss him until his mind is blissfully blank. Let's Henry undress him carefully. He pushes into Henry and feels the tight cords of his shoulders start to release, like how Henry describes unfurling a sail. Henry kisses his mouth over and over again and says quietly, It's much too early for Alex to handle loud noises. There's a sharpness to it he recognizes instantly as Zara before she even speaks, and he wonders why the hell she didn't just call before he reaches for his phone and finds it dead. Shit. That would explain the missed alarm. Alex Claremont Diaz, it is almost seven, Zara shouts through the door. You have a strategy meeting in 15 minutes, and I have a key, so I don't care how naked you are, if you don't answer this door in the next 30 seconds, I'm coming in. He is, he realizes as he rubs his eyes, extremely naked. A cursory examination of the body pressed up against his back. Henry, very comprehensively naked as well. Oh, fuck me, Alex swears, sitting up so fast he gets tangled in the sheets and flails sideways out of bed. <sighs> Henry groans. Fucking shit, says Alex, whose vocabulary is apparently now only expletives. 
He yanks himself free and scrambles for his chinos. God damn it, ass fucker. What? Henry says flatly to the ceiling. I can hear you in there, Alex. I swear to God. There's another sound from the door, like Zara has kicked it, and Henry flies out of bed too. He is truly a picture, wearing an expression of bewildered panic and absolutely nothing else. He eyes the curtains furtively, as if considering hiding in them. Jesus tits, Alex continues as he fumbles to pull his pants up. He snatches a shirt and boxers at random from the floor, shoves them at Henry's chest, and points him toward the closet. Get in there. Quite, he observes. Yes, we can unpack the ironic symbolism later. Go, Alex says, and Henry does. And when the door swings open, Zara is standing there with her thermos and a look in her face that says she did not get a master's degree to babysit a fully grown adult who happens to be related to the president. Zara's eyes do a quick sweep of the room. The sheets on the floor, the two pillows that have been slept on, the two phones on the nightstand. Who is she? She demands, marching over to the bathroom and yanking open the door like she's going to find some Hollywood starlet in the bathtub. You let her bring a phone in here? Nobody. Jesus, Alex says, but his voice cracks in the middle. Zara arches an eyebrow. What? I got kind of drunk last night, that's all. It's chill. Yes, it is so very, very chill that you're going to be hung over for today, Zara says, rounding on him. I'm fine, he says. It's fine. As if on cue, there's a series of bumps from the other side of the closet door, and Henry, halfway into Alex's boxers, comes literally tumbling out of the closet. It is, Alex thinks half hysterically, a very solid visual pun. Uh, Henry says from the floor. He finishes pulling Alex's boxers up his hips, blinks. Hello. The silence stretches. I, Zara begins, do I even want you to explain to me what the fuck is happening here? Literally, how is he even here, like physically or geographically, and why? No. Nope. Don't answer that. Don't tell me anything. She unscrews the top of her thermos and takes a pull of coffee. Oh my god, did I do this? I never thought. When I set it up, oh my god! Henry has pulled himself off the floor and put on a shirt, and his ears are bright red. I think, perhaps, if it helps, it was, uh, rather inevitable. At least for me. So you shouldn't blame yourself. Alex looks at him. Well, I hope it was fun, because if anyone ever finds out about this, we're all fucked, Zara says. She points at Henry. You too. Can I assume I don't have to make you sign an NDA? I've already signed one for him, Alex offers up, while Henry's ears turn from red to an alarming shade of purple. Six hours ago, he was sinking drowsily into Henry's chest, and now he's standing here half-naked, talking about the paperwork. He fucking hates paperwork. I think that covers it. Oh, wonderful, Zara says. I'm so glad you thought this through. Great. How long has this been happening? Since. Um, New Year's, Alex says. New Year's? Zara repeats, eyes wide. This has been going on for seven months? That's why you, oh my God, I thought you were getting into international relations or something. I mean, technically, if you finish that sentence, I'm going to spend tonight in jail. Alex winces. Please don't tell mom. Seriously? She hisses. You're literally putting your dick in the leader of a foreign state who is a man at the biggest political event before the election in a hotel full of reporters in a city full of cameras in a race close enough to fucking hinge on some bullshit like this, like a manifestation of my fucking stress dreams, and you're asking me not to tell the president about it? Um, yeah. I haven't, um, come out to her. Yet. Zara blinks, presses her lips together, and makes a noise like she's being strangled. Listen, she says. We don't have time to deal with this, and your mother has enough to manage without having to process her son's fucking quarter-life NATO sexual crisis, so... 
I won't. You don't have time to deal with this. And your mother has enough to manage without having to process her son's fucking quarter-life NATO sexual crisis, so... I won't tell her. But once the convention is over, you have to. Okay, Alex says on an exhale. Would it make any difference at all if I told you not to see him again? Alex looks over at Henry, looking rumpled and nauseated and terrified at the corner of the bed. No. God fucking damn it, she says, rubbing the heel of her hand against her forehead. Every time I see you, it takes another year off my life. I'm going downstairs, and you better be dressed and there in five minutes so we can try to save this goddamn campaign. And you, she rounds on Henry, you need to get back to fucking England, now. And if anyone sees you leave, I will personally end you. Ask me if I'm afraid of the crown. Duly noted, he says in a faint voice. Zara fixes him with a final glare, turns on her heel, and stalks out of the room, slamming the door behind her. Chapter 9 Okay, he says. His mother sits across the table, hands folded, looking at him expectantly. His palms are starting to sweat. The room is small, one of the lesser conference rooms in the West Wing. He knows he could have asked her to lunch or something, but, well, he kind of panicked. He guesses he should just do it. I've been, um, he starts. I've been figuring some stuff out about myself lately, and... I wanted to let you know because you're my mom, and I want you to be part of my life, and I don't want to hide things from you. And also it's, um, image perspective. Okay, Ellen says, her voice neutral. Okay, he repeats. All right, um, I've realized I'm not straight. I'm actually bisexual. Her expression clears, and she laughs unclasping her hands. Oh, that's it, sugar? God, I was worried it was going to be something worse. She reaches across the table, covering his hand with hers. That's great, baby. I'm so glad you told me. Alex smiles back, the anxious bubble in his chest shrinking slightly. But there's one more bomb to drop. Um, there's something else. I kind of met somebody. She tilts her head. You did? Well, I'm happy for you. I hope you had them do all the paperwork. It's, uh, he interrupts her. It's Henry. A beat. She frowns, her brow knitting together. Henry? Yeah. Henry. Henry as in the prince? Yes. Of England? Yes. So not another Henry. No, Mom. Prince Henry. Of Wales. I thought you hated him, she says. Or now you're friends with him. Both true at different points, but uh, now we're like a thing. Have been a thing for like seven-ish months, I guess. I see. She stares at him for a very long minute. He shifts uncomfortably in his chair. Suddenly, her phone is in her hand, and she's standing, kicking her chair, and says, I need, a uh, time to prepare some materials. Are you free in an hour? We can reconvene here. I'll order food. Bring, uh, your passport and any receipts and relevant documents you have, sugar. She doesn't wait to hear if he's free. She just walks backward out of the room and disappears into the corridor. The door isn't even finished closing when a notification pops up on his phone. Calendar request from mom, 2 p.m., West Wing, first floor, international ethics and sexual identity debrief. An hour later, there are several cartons of Chinese food and a PowerPoint queued up. The first slide says, sexual experimentation with foreign monarchs, a gray area. Alex wonders if it's too late to swan dive off the roof. Okay she says when he sits down, in almost exactly the same tone he used on her earlier. Before we start, I, I want to be clear, I love you and support you always. But this is, 
quite frankly, a logistical and ethical clusterfuck. So we need to make sure we have our ducks in a row. Okay? The next slide is titled, Exploring Your Sexuality. Healthy, but does it have to be with the Prince of England? She apologizes for not having time to come up with better titles. Alex actively wishes for the sweet release of death. The one after is Federal Funding, Travel Expenses, Booty Calls, and You. She's mostly concerned with making sure he hasn't used any federally funded private jets to see Henry for exclusively personal visits. He hasn't. And with making him fill out a bunch of paperwork to cover both their asses. It feels clinical and wrong checking little boxes about his relationship, especially when half are asking things he didn't even discuss with Henry yet. It's agonizing, but eventually it's over. And he doesn't die. Which is something. It's agonizing, but eventually it's over. And he doesn't die. Which is something. His mother takes the last form and seals it up in an envelope with the rest. She sets it aside and takes off her reading glasses setting those aside, too. So, she says, here's the thing. I know I put a lot on you, but I do it because I trust you. You're a dumbass, but I trust you and I trust your judgment. I promised you years ago I would never tell you to be anything you're not. So I'm not going to be the president or the mother who forbids you from seeing him. She takes another breath, waiting for Alex to nod that he understands. But, she goes on, this is a really, really big fucking deal. This is not just some person from class or some intern. You need to think really long and hard because you are putting yourself and your career and above all, this campaign and this entire administration in danger here. I know you're young, but this is a forever decision. Even if you don't stay with him forever. If people find out, that sticks with you forever. So you need to figure out if you feel forever about him. And if you don't, you need to cut it the fuck out. She rests her hands on the table in front of her, and the silence hangs in the air between them. Alex feels like his heart is caught somewhere between his tonsils. Forever. It seems like an impossibly huge word, something he's supposed to grow into ten years from now. Also, she says, I am so sorry to do this, sugar. But you're off the campaign. Alex snaps back into razor-sharp reality, stomach plummeting. Wait, no, this is not up for debate, Alex, she tells him. And she does look sorry, but he knows the set of her jaw too well. This, you're way too close to the sun. We're telling the press you're focusing on other career options. I'll have your desk cleaned out for you over the weekend. She holds out one hand, and Alex looks down into her palm. The worried lines there until the realization clicks. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out his campaign badge. The first artifact of his entire career, a career he's managed to derail in a matter of months. And he hands it over. Oh, one last thing, she says, her tone suddenly businesslike again, shuffling something from the bottom of her files. I know Texas public schools don't have sex ed for shit, and we didn't go over this when we had the talk which is on me for assuming, so I just wanted to make sure you'd know you still need to be using condoms even if you're having anal intercourse. Okay, thanks, Mom, Alex half yells, nearly knocking over his chair in his rush for the door. Wait, honey, she calls after him. I have Planned Parenthood send over all these pamphlets. Take one. They sent a bike messenger and everything. Subject. A mass of fools and knaves. From A. AGCD at eclair45.com, August 10, 2020, 1.04 a.m. To Henry. H. Have you ever read any of Alexander Hamilton's letters to John Lawrence? What am I saying? Of course you haven't. You'd probably be disinherited for revolutionary sympathies. Well, since I got the boot from the campaign, there is literally nothing for me to do but watch cable news diligently chipping away at my brain cells by the day. Reread Harry Potter and sort through all my old shit from college. Just looking at papers, thinking, Excellent, yes, I'm so glad I stayed up all night writing this and exiled to my bedroom. 
Great job, Alex. Is this how you feel in the palace all the time? It fucking sucks, man. So anyway, I'm going through my college stuff, and I find this analysis I did of Hamilton's wartime correspondence. And hear me out, I think Hamilton could have been bi. His letters to Lawrence are almost as romantic as his letters to his wife. Half of them are signed, yours, or affectionately yours. And the last one before Lawrence died is signed, yours forever. I can't figure out why nobody talks about the possibility of a founding father being not straight. Outside of Chernow's biography, which is great, by the way. See attached bibliography. I mean, I know why, but... Anyway, I found this part of a letter he wrote to Lawrence, and it made me think of you. And me, I guess. The truth is, I am an unlucky, honest man. That speaks my sentiments to all and with emphasis. I say this to you because you know it and will not charge me with vanity. I hate Congress. I hate the army. I hate the world. I hate myself. The whole is a mass of fools and knaves. I could almost accept you. Thinking about history makes me wonder how I'll fit into it one day, I guess. And you too. I kind of wish people still wrote like that. History, huh? Bet we could make some. Affectionately yours, slowly going insane, Alex, first son of Founding Father Sacrilege. Subject, re, a mass of fools and knaves. From Henry, hwales at kensingtonemail.com, August 10th, 2020, 418 a.m., to A. Alex, 20, 418 a.m., to A. Alex, first son of masturbatory historical readings. The phrase, see attached bibliography, is the single sexiest thing you have ever written to me. Every time you mention your slow decay inside the White House, I can't help but feel it's my fault, and I feel absolutely shit about it. I'm sorry. I should have known better than to turn up at a thing like that. I got carried away. I didn't think. I know how much that job meant to you. I just want to, you know, extend the option. If you wanted less of me, and more of that, the work, the uncomplicated things, I would understand, truly. In any event, believe it or not, I have actually done a bit of reading on Hamilton for a number of reasons. First, he was a brilliant writer. Second, I knew you were named after him. The pair of you share an alarming number of traits, by the by. Passionate determination, never knowing when to shut up, etc., etc. And third, some saucy tart once tried to impugn my virtue against an oil painting of him, and in the halls of memory, some things demand context. Are you angling for a revolutionary soldier role-play scenario? I must inform you, any trace of King George III blood I have would curdle in my veins and render me useless to you. Or... Are you suggesting you'd rather exchange passionate letters by candlelight? Should I tell you that when we're apart, your body comes back to me in my dreams? That when I sleep, I see you, the tip of your waist, the freckle above your hip, and when I wake up in the morning, it feels like I've just been with you, the phantom touch of your hand on the back of my neck, fresh and not imagined, that I can feel your skin against mine, and it makes and it makes every bone in my body ache. That for a few moments, I can hold my breath and be back there with you, in a dream, in a thousand rooms, nowhere at all. I think perhaps Hamilton said it better in a letter to Eliza. You engross my thoughts too entirely to allow me to think of anything else. You not only employ my mind all day, but you intrude upon my sleep. I meet you in every dream. And when I wake, I cannot close my eyes again for ruminating on your sweetness. If you decide to take the option mentioned at the start of this email, I do hope you haven't read the rest of this rubbish. Regards, haplessly romantic heretic Prince Henry, the utterly daft. Subject, re, a mass of fools and knaves, from a, agcd at eclair45.com. August 10th, 2020, 5.36 a.m. To Henry.
H. Please don't be stupid. No part of any of this will ever be uncomplicated. Anyway, you should be a writer. You are a writer. Even after all this, I still always feel like I want to know more about you. Does that sound crazy? I just sit here and wonder, who is this person who knows stuff about Hamilton and writes like this? Where does someone like that even come from? How was I so wrong? It's weird because I always know things about people, got feelings that usually lead me in more or less the right direction. I do think I got a gut feeling with you. I just didn't have what I needed in my head to understand it. But I kind of kept chasing it anyway, like I was just going blindly in a certain direction and hoping for the best. I guess that makes you the North Star? I want to see her again. You know which one. I want you back here with me. I want your body, and I want the rest of you too. And I want to get the fuck out of this house. Watching June and Nora on TV doing appearances without me is torture. We have this annual thing at my dad's lake house in Texas. Whole long weekend off the grid. There's a lake with a pier, and my dad always cooks something fucking amazing. You want to come? I kind of can't stop thinking about you all sunburned and pretty sitting out there in the country. It's the weekend after next. If Sean can talk to Zara or somebody about flying you into Austin, we can pick you up from there. Say yes. Yours, Alex. P.S. Allen Ginsberg to Peter Orlovsky, 1958. Though I long for the actual sunlight contact between us, I miss you like a home. Shine back, honey, and think of me. Subject, re, a mass of fools and knaves. From Henry, H. Wales at kensingtonemail.com, August 10, 2020, 8.22 p.m. to A. Alex, if I'm north, I shudder to think where in God's name we're going. I'm ruminating on identity and your question about where a person like me comes from. And as best as I can explain it, here's a story. Once there was a young prince who was born in a castle. His mother was a princess scholar, and his father was the most handsome, feared knight in all the land. As a boy, people would bring him everything he could ever dream of wanting. The most beautiful silk clothes, ripe fruit from the orangery. At times, he was so happy he felt he would never grow tired. At times, he was so happy he felt he would never grow tired of being a prince. He came from a long, long line of princes, but never before had there been a prince quite like him, born with his heart on the outside of his body. When he was small, his family would smile and laugh and say he would grow out of it one day. But as he grew, it stayed where it was, red and visible and alive. He didn't mind it very much, but every day the family's fear grew that the people of the kingdom would soon notice and turn their backs on the prince. His grandmother, the queen, lived in a high tower, where she spoke only of the other princes, past and present, who were born whole. Then the prince's father, the knight, was struck down in battle. The lance tore open his armor and his body and left him bleeding in the dust. And so, when the queen sent new clothes, armor for the prince to parcel his heart away safe, the prince's mother did not stop her, for she was afraid now, afraid of her son's heart torn open too. So the prince wore it, and for many years he believed it was right until he met the most devastatingly gorgeous peasant boy from a nearby village who said absolutely ghastly things to him that made him feel alive for the first time in years, and who turned out to be the most mad sort of sorcerer, one who could conjure up things like gold and vodka shots and apricot tarts out of absolutely nothing. And the prince's whole life went up in a puff of dazzling purple smoke, and the kingdom said, I can't believe we're all so surprised. I'm in for the lake house. I must admit, I'm glad you're getting out of the house. I must admit, I'm glad you're getting out of the house. I worry you may burn the thing down.
Does this mean I'll be meeting your father? I miss you. Kisses. Henry. P.S. This is mortifying and maudlin, and honestly, I hope you forget it as soon as you've read it. P.P.S. From Henry James to Hendrick C. Anderson. 1899. May the terrific USA be meanwhile not a brute to you. I feel in you a confidence, dear boy, which to show is a joy to me. My hopes and desires and sympathies right heartily and most firmly go with you. So keep up your heart and tell me, as it shapes itself, your, inevitably I imagine, more or less weird American story. May, at any rate, tutta che la gente be good to you. Do not, Nora says, leaning over the passenger seat. There is a system, and you must respect the system. I don't believe in systems when I'm on vacation, June says, her body folded halfway over Alex's, trying to slap Nora's hand out of the way. It's math, Nora says. Math has no authority here, June tells her. Math is everywhere, June. Get off me, Alex says, shoving June off his shoulder. You're supposed to back me up on this, June yelps, pulling his hair and receiving a very ugly face in response. I'll let you look at one boob, Nora tells him. The good one. They're both good, June says, suddenly distracted. I've seen both of them. I can practically see both of them now, Alex says, gesturing at what Nora is wearing for the day, which is a ratty pair of short overalls and the most perfunctory of bra-like things. Hashtag vacation nips. She's Nora did put more hours into her playlist, so she should get the aux cord. There's a combination of girl sounds from the back seat, disgust and triumph. And Nora plugs her phone in, swearing she's developed some kind of foolproof algorithm for the perfect road trip playlist. The first trumpets of Loco and Acapulco by the Four Tops blast, and Alex finally pulls out of the gas station. The Jeep is a refurb a project his dad took on when Alex was around 10. It lives in California now, but he drives it into Texas once a year for this weekend, leaves it in Austin so Alex and June can drive it in. Alex learned to drive one summer in the valley in this Jeep, and the accelerator feels just as good under his foot now as he falls into formation with two black Secret Service SUVs and heads for the interstate. He hardly ever gets to drive himself anywhere anymore. The sky is wide open, and blue bonnet blue for miles. The sun low and heavy with an early morning start, and Alex has his sunglasses on, and his arms bare, and the doors and roof off. He cranks up the stereo and feels like he could throw anything away on the wind whipping through his hair, and it would just float away like it never was, as if nothing matters but the rush and skip in his chest. But it's all right behind the haze of dopamine, losing the campaign job, the restless days pacing his room. Do you feel forever about him? He tips his chin up to the warm, sticky hometown air, catches his own eye in the rearview mirror. He looks bronzed and soft-mouthed and young, a Texas boy, the same kid he was when he left for D.C. So, no more big thoughts for today. Outside the hangar are a handful of PPOs and Henry in a short-sleeved chambray, shorts, and a pair of fashionable sunglasses, and a pair of fashionable sunglasses, Burberry Weekender over one shoulder, a goddamn summer dream. Nora's playlist has segued into Here You Come Again, by Dolly Parton by the time Alex swings out of the side of the jeep by one arm. Yes, hello, hello, it's good to see you too. Henry is saying from somewhere inside a smothering hug from June and Nora. Alex bites his lip and watches Henry squeeze their waists in return. And then Alex has him, inhaling the clean smell of him, laughing into the crook of his neck. Hi, love, he hears Henry say quietly, privately, right into the hair above his ear. And Alex's breath forgets how to do anything but laugh helplessly. Drums, please! erupts the jeep stereo, and the beat on summertime kicks in, and Alex whoops his approval. Once Henry's security team has fallen in with the Secret Service cars, they're off.
Henry is grinning wide beside him as they cruise down 45, happily bopping his head along to the music. And Alex can't help glancing over at him, feeling giddy that Henry, Henry the Prince, is here, in Texas, coming home with him. June pulls four bottles of Mexican Coke out of the cooler under her seat and passes them around. And Henry takes the first sip and practically melts. Alex reaches over and takes Henry's free hand into his own, lacing their fingers together on the console between them. It takes an hour and a half to get out to Lake LBJ from Austin, and when they start weaving their way toward the water, Henry asks, Why is it called Lake LBJ? Nora, Alex says. Lake LBJ, Nora says, or Lake Lyndon B. Johnson is one of six reservoirs formed by Lake Lyndon B. Johnson is one of six reservoirs formed by dams on the Colorado River known as the Texas Highland Lakes, made possible by LBJ enacting the Rural Electrification Act when he was president. And LBJ had a place out here. That's true, Alex says. Also, fun fact, LBJ was obsessed with his own dick, Nora adds. He called it Jumbo and would whip it out all the time, like in front of colleagues, reporters, anybody. Also true. American politics, Henry says, truly fascinating. You want to talk Henry VIII? Alex says. Anyway, Henry says airily, how long have you lot come out here? Dad bought it when he and Mom split up, so when I was 12, Alex tells him. He wanted to have a place close to us after he moved. We used to spend so much time here in the summers. Oh, Alex, remember when you got drunk for the first time out here? June says. Strawberry daiquiris all day. You threw up so much, she says fondly. They pull into a driveway flanked by thick trees and drive up to the house at the top of the hill. The same old vibrant orange exterior and smooth arches, tall cactuses and aloe plants. His mom was never into the whole Hacienda school of home decor, so his dad went all in when he bought the lake house. Tall teal doors and heavy wooden beams and Spanish tile accents in pinks and red. There's a big wraparound porch and stairs leading down the hill to the dock and all the windows facing the water have been flung open, the curtains drifting out on a warm breeze. Their teams fall back to check the perimeter. They're renting out the place next door for added privacy and the obligatory security presence. Henry effortlessly lifts June's cooler up onto one shoulder, and Alex pointedly does not swoop around the corner, dripping and apparently fresh from a swim. He's wearing his old brown hirachis and a pair of swim trunks with parrots on them. Both arms extended to the sun, and June is summarily scooped up into them. CJ, he says, as he spins her around and deposits her on the stucco railing. Nora is next, and then a bone-crushing hug for Alex. Henry steps forward, and Oscar looks him up and down. The Burberry bag, the cooler on his shoulder, the elegant smile, the extended hand. His dad had been confused, but ultimately willing to roll with it when Alex asked if he could bring a friend and casually mentioned the friend would be the Prince of Wales. He's not sure how this will go. Hello, Henry says. Good to meet you. I'm Henry. Oscar slaps his hand into Henry's. Hope you're ready to fucking party. Oscar may be the cook of the family but Alex's mom was the one who grilled. It didn't always track in Pemberton Heights, his Mexican dad in the house diligently soaking a tres leches while his blonde mom stood out in the yard flipping burgers. But it worked. Alex determinedly picked up the best from both of them, and now he's the only one here who can handle racks of ribs while Oscar does the rest. The kitchen of the lake house faces the water, always smelling like citrus and salt and herbs, and his dad keeps it stocked with plump tomatoes and clay-soft avocados when they're visiting. He's standing in front of the big open windows now, three racks of ribs spread out on pans on the counter in front of him. His dad is at the sink, shucking ears of corn and humming along to an old Shente record. Brown sugar, smoked paprika, onion powder, bean powder, chili powder, garlic powder, Cayenne pepper, salt, pepper, 
more brown sugar. Alex measures each one out with his hands and dumps them into the bowl. Down by the dock, June and Nora are embroiled in what looks like an improvising jousting match, charging at each other on the backs of inflatable animals with pool noodles. Henry is tipsy and shirtless and attempting to referee, standing on the dock with one foot on a piling and waving a bottle of shiner around like a madman. Alex smiles a little to himself, watching them. Henry and his girls. So, you want to talk about it? says his father's voice in Spanish from somewhere to his left. Alex jumps a little, startled. His dad has relocated to the bar a few feet down from him, mixing up a big batch of cotija and crema and seasonings for elotes. Uh, has he been that obvious already? About Raf. Alex exhales, his shoulders dropping, and returns his attention to the dry rub. Ah, that motherfucker, he says. They've only broached the topic in passing obscenities over text since the news broke. There's a mutual sting of betrayal. Do you have any idea what he's thinking? I don't have anything kinder to say about him than you do, and I don't have an explanation either. But... He pauses thoughtfully, still stirring. Alex can sense him weighing out several thoughts at once, as he often does. I don't know. After all this time, I want to believe there's a reason for him to put himself in the same room as Jeffrey Richards. But I can't figure out what. Alex thinks about the conversation he overheard in the housekeeper's office, wondering if his dad is ever going to let him in on the full picture. He doesn't know how to ask without revealing that he literally climbed into a bush to eavesdrop on them. He doesn't know how to ask without revealing that he literally climbed into a bush to eavesdrop on them. His dad's relationship with Luna has always been like that. Grown-up talk. Alex was at the fundraiser for Oscar's Senate run when they first met Luna. Alex, only 15, and already taking notes. Luna showed up with a pride flag unapologetically stuck in his lapel. Alex wrote that down. Why'd you pick him? Alex asks. I remember that campaign. We met a lot of people who would have made great politicians, why wouldn't you pick someone easier to elect? You mean, why'd I roll the dice on the gay one? Alex concentrates on keeping his face neutral. I wasn't going to put it like that, he says. But yeah. Raph ever tell you his parents kicked him out when he was 16? Alex winces. I knew he had a hard time before college, but he didn't specify. Yeah, they didn't take the news so well. He had a rough couple of years, but it made him tough. The night we met him, it was the first time he'd been back in California since he got kicked out. But he was damn sure gonna come in to support a brother out of Mexico City. It was like when Zara showed up at your mom's office in Austin and she wanted to prove the bastards wrong. You know a fighter when you see one. Yeah, Alex says. There's another pause of Chente crooning in the background while his dad stirs before he speaks again. You know, he says, that summer I sent you to work on his campaign because you're the best point man I got. I knew you could do it, but I really thought there was a lot you could learn from him too. You got a lot in common. Alex says nothing for a long moment. I gotta be honest, his dad says, and when Alex looks up again, he's watching the window. Alex laughs, glancing back out at Henry, the sway of his back under the afternoon sun. He's tougher than he looks. Not bad for a European, his dad says. Better than half the idiots June's brought home. Alex's hands freeze, and his head jerks back to his dad, who's still stirring with his heavy wooden spoon, face impartial. Half the girls you've brought around, too. Not better than Nora, though. She'll always be my favorite. Alex stares at him, until his dad finally looks up. What? You're not as subtle as you think. I, I don't know, Alex sputters. I thought you might need to, like, have a Catholic moment about this or something. His dad slaps him on the bicep with a spoon, leaving a splatter of crema and cheese behind. Have a little more faith in your old man than that, eh? A little appreciation for the patron saint of gender-neutral bathrooms in California. Little shit. Okay, okay, sorry, Alex says, laughing. 
I just know it's different when it's your own kid. His dad laughs too, rubbing a hand over his goatee. It's really not. Not to me anyway. I see you. Alex smiles again. I know. Does your ma know? Yeah, I told her a couple weeks ago. How'd she take it? I mean, she doesn't care that I'm bi. She kind of freaked out it was him. There was a PowerPoint. That sounds about right. She fired me, and uh, she told me I need to figure out if the way I feel about him is worth the risk. Well, is it? Alex groans. Please, for the love of God, do not ask me. I'm on vacation. I want to get drunk and eat barbecue in peace. His dad laughs ruefully. <laughs> you know, in a least, your mom and me were a stupid idea. I think we both knew it wouldn't be forever. We're both too fucking proud. But God, that woman. Your mother is, without question, the love of my life. I'll never love anyone else like that. It was wildfire. And I got you and June out of it. Best things that ever happened to an old asshole like me. That kind of love is rare, even if it was a complete disaster. He sucks his teeth, considering. Sometimes you just jump and hope it's not a cliff. Alex closes his eyes. Are you done with the dad monologues for the day? You're such a shit, he says, throwing a kitchen towel at his head. Go put the ribs on. I want to eat today. He calls after Alex is back. You two better take the bunk beds tonight. Santa Maria is watching. They eat later that evening. Big piles of elotes, pork tamale with salsa verde, a clay pot of frijoles charros, ribs. Henry gamely piles his plate with some of each and eyeballs it as if waiting for it to reveal its secrets to him. And Alex realizes Henry has never eaten barbecue with his hands before. Alex demonstrates and watches with poorly concealed glee as Henry gingerly picks up a rib with his fingertips and considers his approach, cheering as Henry dives in face first and rips a hunk of meat off with his teeth. He chews proudly, a huge smear of barbecue sauce across his upper lip and the tip of his nose. His dad keeps an old guitar in the living room, and June brings it out on the porch so the two of them can pass it back and forth. Nora one of Alex's chambrays thrown on over her bikini, floats barefoot in and out, keeping all their glasses filled from a pitcher of sangria brimming with white peaches and blackberries. They sit around the fire pit and play old Johnny Cash songs, Selena, Fleetwood Mac. And when his dad slumps off to bed, June's songbird one. He feels wrapped up and warm, turning slowly under the moon. He and Henry drift to a swing at the edge of the porch, and he curls into Henry's side, buries his face in the collar of his shirt. Henry puts an arm around him, touches the hinge of Alex's jaw with fingers that smell like smoke. June plucks away at Annie's song. You fill up my senses like a night in a forest. And the breeze keeps moving to meet the highest branches of the trees, and the water keeps rising to meet the bulkheads, and Henry leans down to meet Alex's mouth. And Alex is... Well, Alex is so in love, he could die. Alex falls out of bed the following morning with a low-grade hangover, and one of Henry's swimsuits tangled around his elbow. They did, technically, sleep in separate bunks. They just didn't start there. Over the kitchen sink, he chugs a glass of water and stares out the window, the sun blinding and bright on the lake, and there's an incandescent little stone of certainty at the bottom of his chest. It's this place, the absolute separation from D.C., the familiar old smells of cedar trees and dried chile de arbol, the sanity of it, the roots. He could go outside and dig his fingers into the springy ground and understand anything about himself. And he does understand, really. He loves Henry, and it's nothing new. He's been falling in love with Henry for years, probably since he first saw him in glossy print on the pages of J-14, almost definitely since Henry pinned Alex to the floor of a medical supply closet and told him to shut the hell up. That long. That much. Medical supply closet and told him to shut the hell up. That long. That much. 
He smiles as he reaches for a frying pan because he knows it's exactly the kind of insane risk he can't resist. By the time Henry comes wandering into the kitchen in his pajamas, there's an entire breakfast spread on the long green table, and Alex is at the stove, flipping his dozenth pancake. Is that an apron? Alex flourishes toward the polka-dotted thing he's got on over his boxers with his free hand, as if showing off one of his tailored suits. Morning, sweetheart. Sorry, Henry says. I was looking for someone else. Handsome, petulant, short, not pleasant until after 10 a.m. Have you seen him? Fuck off. Five nine is average. Henry crosses the room with a laugh and nudges up behind him at the stove to peck him on the cheek. Love, you and I both know you're rounding up. It's only a step on the way to the coffee maker, but Alex reaches back and gets a hand in Henry's hair before he can move, pulling him into a kiss on the mouth this time. Henry huffs a little in surprise, but returns it fully. Alex forgets momentarily about the pancakes and everything else. Not because he wants to do absolutely filthy things to Henry, maybe even with the apron still on, but because he loves him. And isn't that wild, to know that that's what makes the filthy things so good? I didn't realize this was a jazz brunch, says Nora's voice suddenly, and Henry springs backward so fast he almost puts his ass in the bowl of batter. She sidles up to the forgotten coffee maker, grinning slyly at them. That doesn't seem sanitary, June is saying with a yawn as she folds herself into a chair at the table. Sorry, Henry says sheepishly. Don't be, Nora tells him. I'm hungover, June says as she reaches for the pitcher of mimosas. Alex, you did all this? Alex shrugs, and June squints at him. Bleary, but knowing. That afternoon... Over the sound of the boat's engine, Henry talks to Alex's dad about the sailboats that jut up from the horizon, getting into a complex discussion on outboard motors that Alex can't hope to follow. He leans back against the bow and watches, and it's so easy to imagine it. A future Henry who comes to the lake house with him every summer, who learns how to make elotes and tie neat cleat hitches and fits right into place in his weird family. They go swimming yell over one another about politics, pass the guitar around again. Henry takes a photo of himself with June and Nora, one under each arm and both in their bikinis. Nora is holding his chin in one hand and licking the side of his face, and June has her fingers tangled up in his hair and her head in the crook of his neck, smiling angelically at the camera. He sends it to Pez and receives anguished key smashes and crying emojis in response, and they all almost piss themselves laughing. It's good. It's really, really good. Alex lies awake that night, drunk on Shiner and way too many campfire marshmallows, and he stares at whorls in the wood panel of the top bunk and thinks about coming of age out here. He remembers when he was a kid, freckly and unafraid, when the world seemed like it was blissfully endless, but everything still made perfect sense. He used to leave his clothes in a pile on the pier and dive headfirst into the lake. Everything was in its right place. He wears a key to his childhood home around his neck, but he doesn't know the last time he actually thought about the boy who used to put it into the lock. He thinks about roots, about first and second languages, what he wanted when he was a kid and what he wants now and where those things overlap. Maybe that place. The meeting of the two is here somewhere, in the gentle insistence of the water around his legs, crude letters carved with an old pocket knife, the steady thrum of another person's pulse against his. H, he whispers. You awake? Henry sighs. Always. They sneak through the grass in hushed voices past one of Henry's PPOs dozing on the porch, racing down the pier, shoving at each other's shoulders. Henry's laugh is high and clear, his sunburned shoulders bright pink in the dark, and Alex looks at him, and something so buoyant fills up his chest that he feels like he could swim the length of the lake without stopping for air. He throws his t-shirt down at the end of the pier and starts to shuck his boxers, and when Henry arches an eyebrow at him, Alex laughs and jumps. You're a menace, 
Henry says, when Alex breaks back to the surface. But he only hesitates briefly before he's stripping out of his clothes. He stands naked at the edge of the pier, looking at Alex's head and shoulders bobbing in the water. The lines of him are long and languid in the moonlight, just skin and skin and skin, lit soft and blue, and he's so beautiful that Alex thinks this moment, the soft shadows and pale thighs and crooked smile, should be the portrait of Henry that goes down in history. There are fireflies winking around his head, landing in his hair. A crown. His dive is infuriatingly graceful. Can't you ever just do one thing without having to be so goddamn extra about it? Alex says, splashing him infuriatingly graceful. Can't you ever just do one thing without having to be so goddamn extra about it? Alex says, splashing him as soon as he surfaces. That is bloody rich coming from you, Henry says, and he's grinning like he does when he's drinking in a challenge, like nothing in the world pleases him more than Alex's antagonizing elbow on his side. I don't know what you're talking about, Alex says, kicking over to him. They chase each other around the pier, race down to the lake's shallow bottom, and shoot back up in the moonlight, all elbows and knees. Alex finally manages to catch Henry around the waist, and he pins him, slides his wet mouth over the thudding pulse of Henry's throat. He wants to stay tangled up in Henry's legs forever. He wants to match the new freckles across Henry's nose to the stars above them, and make him name the constellations. Hey, he says, his mouth right up in a breath's space from Henry's. He watches a drop of water roll down Henry's perfect nose and disappear into his mouth. Hi, Henry says back, and Alex thinks, God damn, I love him. It keeps coming back to him, and it's getting harder to look into Henry's soft smiles and not say it. He kicks out a little to turn them in a slow circle. You look good out here. Henry's grin goes crooked and a little shy, dipping down to brush against Alex's jaw. Yeah? Yeah, Alex says. He twists Henry's wet hair around his fingers. I'm glad you came this weekend, Alex hears himself say. It's been so intense lately, I... I really needed this. Henry's fingers give a little jab to his ribs, gently scolding. You carry too much. His instinct, but he bites it back and says, I know. And he realizes it's the truth. You know what I'm thinking right now? What? I'm thinking about, after inauguration, like next year, taking you back out here, just the two of us, and we can sit under the moon and not stress about anything. Oh, Henry says. That sounds nice, if unlikely. Come on, think about it, babe. Next year, my mom will be in office again, and we won't have to worry about winning any more elections. I'll finally be able to breathe. Ah, oh, it'll be amazing. I'll cook migas in the morning, and we'll swim all day, and never put clothes on, and make out on the pier. And it won't even matter if the neighbors see. Well, it will matter, you know. It will always matter. He pulls back to find Henry's face indecipherable. You know what I mean. Henry's looking at him, and looking at him. And Alex can't shake the feeling Henry's really seeing him for the first time. He realizes it's probably the only time he's ever invited love into a conversation with Henry on purpose, and it must be lying wide open on his face. Something moves behind Henry's eyes. Where are you going with all this? Alex tries to figure out how the hell to funnel everything he needs to tell Henry into words. June says I have a fire under my ass for no good reason, he says. I don't know. You know how they always say to take it one day at a time? I think I take it ten years in the future. Like when I was in high school, it was all, well, my parents hate each other, and my sister is leaving for college, and sometimes I look at other guys in the shower. But if I keep looking directly ahead, the job. I used to think, if I pictured the person I wanted to be and took all the crazy anxiety in my brain and narrowed it down to that point, I could rewire it, 
use it to power something else. It's like, I never learned to just be where I am. Alex takes a breath. And where I am is here, with you. And I'm thinking maybe I should start trying to take it day by day. And just feel what I feel. Henry doesn't say anything. Sweetheart. The water ripples quietly around him as he slides his hands up to hold Henry's face in both palms, tracing his cheekbones with the wet pads of his thumbs. The cicadas and the wind and the lake are probably still making sounds somewhere, but it's all faded into silence. Alex can't hear anything but his heartbeat in his ears. Henry, I... Abruptly, Henry shifts, ducking beneath the surface and out of his arms before he can say anything else. He pops back up near the pier, hair sticking to his forehead, and Alex turns around and stares at him, breathless at the loss. Henry spits out lake water and sends a splash in his direction, and Alex forces a laugh. Christ, Henry says, slapping at a bug that's landed on him. What are these infernal creatures? Mosquitoes, Alex supplies. They're awful, Henry says loftily. I'm going to catch an exotic plague. I'm... Sorry? I just mean to say, you know, Philip is the heir and I'm the spare. And if that nervy bastard has a heart attack at 35 and I've got malaria, wither the spare. Alex laughs weakly again. But he's got a distinct feeling of something being pulled out of his hands right before he could grasp it. Henry's tone has gone light. Alex laughs weakly again. But he's got a distinct feeling of something being pulled out of his hands right before he could grasp it. Henry's tone has gone light, clipped, superficial, his press voice. At any rate, I'm knackered, Henry is saying now. And Alex watches helplessly as he turns and starts hauling himself out of the water and onto the dock, pulling his shorts back up shivering legs. If it's all the same to you, I think I'll go to bed. Alex doesn't know what to say, so he watches Henry walk the long line of the dock, disappearing into the darkness. A ringing, scooped-out sensation starts behind his molars and rolls down his throat, into his chest, down to the pit of his stomach. Something's wrong, and he knows it, but he's too afraid to push back or ask. That, he realizes suddenly, is the danger of allowing love into this. The acknowledgement that if something goes wrong, he doesn't know how he will stand it. For the first time since Henry grabbed him and kissed him, with so much certainty in the garden, the thought enters Alex's mind. What if it was never his decision to make? What if he got so wrapped up in everything Henry is, the words he writes, the earnest heartsickness of him, he forgot to take into account that it's just how he is, all the time, with everyone? What if he's done the thing he swore he would never do, the thing he hates, and fallen in love with a prince because it was a fantasy. When he gets back to their room, Henry's already in his bunk and silent, his back turned. In the morning, Henry is gone. Alex wakes up to find his bunk empty and made up, the pillow tucked neatly, only to find it empty as well. The yard is empty. The pier is empty. It's like he was never even there. He finds the note in the kitchen. Alex, had to go early for a family matter. Left with the PPOs. Didn't want to wake you. Thank you for everything. Kisses. It's the last message Henry sends him. Chapter 10 he sends Henry five texts the first day, two the second. By day three, none. He spent too much of his life talking, 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 not to know the signs when someone doesn't want to hear him anymore. He starts forcing himself to only check his phone once every two hours instead of once an hour, making himself hang on by his fingernails until the minutes tick down. A few times he gets wrapped up in obsessively reading press coverage of the campaign and realizes he hasn't checked in hours, and every time he's hit with a hiccuping, desperate hope that there will be something. 
there never is. He thought he was reckless before, but he understands now. Holding love off was the only thing keeping him from losing himself in this completely. And he's gone, stupid, lovesick, a fucking disaster. No work to distract him. The tripwire of things only people in love say and do set off. So instead, a Tuesday night, hiding on the roof of the residence, pacing so many furious laps that the skin on the back of his heels splits open and blood soaks into his loafers. His Claremont for America mug returned in a carefully marked box from his desk at the campaign office, a concrete reminder of what this already costing up from the kitchens and his throat going painfully tight. Two and a half different dreams about sandy hair wrapped around his fingers. A three-line email, an excerpt dug up from an archived letter. Hamilton to Lawrence, you should not have taken advantage of my sensibility to steal into my affections without my consent. Drafted and deleted. On day five, Rafael Luna makes his fifth campaign stop as a surrogate. The Richards campaign's token two for minority. Alex hits a momentary emotional impasse. Either destroy something or destroy himself. He ends up smashing his phone on the pavement outside the Capitol. The screen is replaced by the end of the day. It doesn't make any messages from Henry magically appear. On the morning of day seven, he's digging in the back of his closet when he stumbles upon a bundle of teal silk. The stupid kimono Pez had made for him. He hasn't taken it out since L.A., He's about to shove it back into the corner when he feels something in the pocket. He finds a small folded square of paper. It's stationary from their hotel that night, the night everything inside Alex rearranged. And that is, officially, too fucking much. What he does next, he's sure he'll have no memory of doing. Simply a white noise gap of time that got him from point A to point B. He texts Cash. What are you doing for the next 24 hours? Then he unearths the emergency credit card from his wallet and buys two plane tickets, first class, nonstop, boarding in two hours. Dulles International to Heathrow. Zara nearly refuses to secure a car after Alex had the goddamn nerve to call her from the runway at Dulles. It's dark and pissing down rain when they land in London, around nine in the evening, and he and Cash are both soaked the second they climb out of the car inside the back gates of Kensington. Clearly, someone has radioed for Sean, because he's standing there at the door to Henry's apartments in an impeccable gray peacoat, dry and unmoved, under a black umbrella. Mr. Claremont Diaz, he says, what a treat. Alex has not got the damn time. Move, Sean. Mr. Bankston called ahead to warn me that you are on the way. He says, as you might have guessed by the ease with which you were able to get through our gates, we thought it best to let you kick up a fuss somewhere more private. Move. Sean smiles, looking as if he might be genuinely enjoying watching two hapless Americans become slowly waterlogged. You're aware it's quite late, and it's well within my power to have security remove you. No member of the royal family has invited you into the palace. Bullshit, Alex bites out. I need to see Henry. I'm afraid I can't do that. The prince does not wish to be disturbed. God damn it. Henry! He sidesteps Sean and starts shouting up at Henry's bedroom windows, where there's a light on. Fat raindrops are pelting his eyeballs. Henry! Somewhere more private. Move. Sean smiles looking as if he might be genuinely enjoying watching two hapless Americans become slowly waterlogged. You're aware it's quite late, and it's well within my power to have security remove you. No member of the royal family has invited you into the palace. Bullshit, Alex bites out. I need to see Henry. I'm afraid I can't do that. The prince does not wish to be disturbed. God damn it. Henry! He sidesteps Sean and starts shouting up at Henry's bedroom windows, where there's a light on. Fat raindrops are pelting his eyeballs. Henry, you motherfucker! Alex, says Cash's nervous voice behind him. Henry, you piece of shit! Get your ass down here! 
you are making a scene, Sean says placidly. Yeah, Alex says, still yelling. How about I just keep yelling and we see which of the papers shows up first? He turns back to the window and starts flailing his arms too. Henry, your royal fucking highness. Sean touches a finger to his earpiece. Team Bravo, we've got a situation. For Christ's sake, Alex, what are you doing? Alex freezes, his mouth open around another shout. And there's Henry standing behind Sean in the doorway, barefoot and worn in sweats. Alex's heart is going to fall out of his ass. Henry looks unimpressed. He drops his arms. Tell him to let me in. Henry sighs, pinching the bridge of his nose. It's fine. He can come in. Thank you, he says, pointedly looking at Sean, who does not seem to care at all if he dies of hypothermia. He sloshes into the palace, ditching his so led the way in, hasn't even stopped to speak to him, and all Alex can do is follow him up the grand staircase toward his rooms. Really nice. Alex yells after him, dripping as aggressively as he can manage along the way. He hopes he ruins a rug. Fucking ghost me for a week, make me stand in the rain like a brown John Cusack, and now you won't even talk to me. I'm really just having a great time here. I can see why y'all had to marry your fucking cousins. I'd rather not do this where we might be overheard, Henry says, taking a left on the landing. Alex stomps up after him, following him into his bedroom. Do what, he says, as Henry shuts the door behind them. What are you going to do, Henry? Henry turns to face him at last, and now that Alex's eyes aren't full of rainwater, he can see the skin under his eyes is papery and purple, rimmed pink at his eyelashes. There's a tense set to his shoulders Alex hasn't seen in months. Not directed at him, at least. I'm going to let you say what you need to say, Henry says flatly, so you can leave. Alex stares. What? And then we're over? Henry doesn't answer him. Something rises in Alex's throat. Anger, confusion, hurt, bile. Unforgivably, he feels like he might cry. Seriously? He says, helpless and indignant. He's still dripping. What the fuck is going on? A week ago, it was emails about how much you missed me and meeting my fucking dad, and that's it? You thought you could fucking ghost me? I can't shut this off like you do, Henry. Henry paces over to the elaborately carved fireplace across the room and leans on the mantelpiece. You think I don't care as much as you? You're sure as hell acting like it. Wrong. Jesus, would you stop being an obtuse fucking asshole for like 20 seconds? So glad you flew here to insult me. I fucking love you. Okay? Alex half yells, finally, irreversibly. Henry goes very still against the mantelpiece. Alex watches him swallow, watches the muscle that keeps twitching in his jaw, and feels like he might shake out of his skin. Fuck, I swear. You don't make it fucking easy. But I'm in love with you. A small click cuts the silence. Henry has taken his signet ring off and set it down on the mantel. He holds his naked hand on his chest, kneading the palm, the flickering light from the fire painting his face in dramatic shadows. Do you have any idea what that means? Of course I do, Alex. Please, Henry says. And when he finally turns to look at him, he looks wretched, miserable. Don't. This is the entire goddamn reason. I can't do this. And you know why I can't do this. So please, don't make me say it. Alex swallows hard. You're not even going to try to be happy. For Christ's sake, Henry says. I've been trying to be happy my entire idiot life. My birthright is a country, not happiness. Alex yanks the soggy note out of his pocket. I wish there weren't a wall. And throws it at Henry viciously. Watches him pick it up. Then what is that supposed to mean? If you don't want this. 
Henry stares down at his words from months ago. Alex, Thisbe and Pyramus books groans. So what? Was this all never going to be anything real to you? And Henry snaps. You really are a complete idiot if you believe that, Henry hisses, the note bald in his fist. When have I ever, since the first instant I touched you, pretended to be anything less than in love with you? Are you so fucking self-absorbed as to think this is about you and whether or not I love you, rather than the fact I'm an heir to the fucking throne? You at least have the option to not choose a public life eventually, but I will live and die in these palaces and in this family. So don't you dare come to me and question if I love you when it's the thing that could bloody well ruin everything. Alex doesn't speak, doesn't move, doesn't breathe, his feet rooted to the spot. Henry isn't looking at him, but staring at a point on the mantle somewhere, tugging at his own hair in exasperation. It was never supposed to be an issue, he goes on, his voice hoarse. I thought I could have some part of you and just never say it, and you'd never have to know, and one day you'd get tired of me and leave, because I'm... He stops short, and one shaking hand moves through the air in front of him in a helpless sort of gesture at everything about himself. I never thought I'd be stood here, faced with a choice I can't make, because I never... I never imagined you would love me back. Well, Alex says, I do. And you can choose. You know bloody well I can't. You can try, Alex tells him, feeling as if it should be the simplest fucking truth in the world. What do you want? You can try, Alex tells him, feeling as if it should be the simplest fucking truth in the world. What do you want? I want you then fucking have me, but I don't want this. Alex wants to grab Henry and shake him, wants to scream in his face, wants to smash every priceless antique in the room. What does that even mean? I don't want it, Henry practically shouts. His eyes are flashing, wet and angry and afraid. Don't you bloody see? I'm not like you. I can't afford to be reckless. I don't have a family who will support me. I don't go about shoving who I am in everyone's faces and dreaming about a career in fucking politics so I can be more scrutinized and picked apart by the entire godforsaken world. I can love you and want you and still not want that life. I'm allowed, all right, and it doesn't make me a liar. It makes me a man with some infinitesimal shred of self-preservation, unlike you. And you don't get to come here and call me a coward for it. Alex takes a breath. I never said you were a coward. I... Henry blinks. Well, the point stands. You think I want your life? You think I want Martha's? Gilded fucking cage? Barely allowed to speak in public? Or have a goddamn opinion? Then what are we even doing here? Why are we fighting, then, if the lives we have to lead are so incompatible? Because you don't want that either, Alex insists. You don't want any of this bullshit. You hate it. Don't tell me what I want, Henry says. You haven't a clue how it feels. Look, I might not be a fucking royal, Alex says, cross space, but I know what it's like for your whole life to be determined by the family you were born into, okay? The lives we want, they're not that different, not in the ways that matter. You want to take what you were given and leave the world better than you found it. So do I. We can, we can figure out a way to do that, together. Henry stares at him silently, and Alex can see the scales balancing in his head. I don't think I can. Alex turns away from him, falling back on his heels like he's been slapped. Fine, he finally says. You know what? Fucking fine. I'll leave. Good. I'll leave, he says, and he turns back and leans in. 
as soon as you tell me to leave. Alex. He's in Henry's face now. If he's getting his heart broken tonight, he's sure as hell going to make Henry have the guts to do it right. Tell me you're done with me. I'll get back on the plane. That's it. And you can live here in your tower and be miserable forever. Write a whole book of sad fucking poems about it. Whatever. Just say it. Fuck you. Henry says, his voice breaking. And he gets a handful of Alex's shirt collar, and Alex knows he's going to love this stubborn shithead forever. Tell me, he says, a ghost of a smile around his lips. To leave. He feels before he registers being shoved backward into a wall, and Henry's mouth is on his, desperate and wild. The faint taste of blood blooms on his tongue, and he smiles as he opens up to it, pushes it into Henry's mouth, tugging. They grapple along the wall until Henry physically picks him up off the floor and staggers backward toward the bed. Alex bounces when his back hits the mattress, and Henry stands over him for several breaths, staring. Alex would give anything to know what's going through that fucking head of his. He realizes suddenly. Henry's crying. He swallows. That's the thing. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if this is supposed to be some kind of consummation or if it's one last time. He doesn't think he could go through with it if he knew it was the latter. But he doesn't want to go home without having this. Come here. He fucks Henry slow and deep. And if it's the last time, they go down shivering and gasping, and epic. All wet mouths and wet eyelashes, and Alex is a cliché on an ivory bedspread, and he hates himself, but he's so in love. He's in stupid, unbearable love, and Henry loves him too. And at least for one night, it matters, even if they both have to pretend to forget in the morning. Henry comes with his face turned into Alex's open palm his bottom lip catching on the knob of his wrist, and Alex tries to memorize every detail down to how his lashes fan across his cheeks and the pink flush that spreads all the way up to his ears. He tells his too fast brain, don't miss it this time. He's too important. It's pitch black outside when Henry's body finally subsides and the room is impossibly quiet. The fire gone out. Alex rolls over onto his side and touches two fingers to his chest, right next to where the key on the chain rests. His heart is beating the same as ever under his skin, right next to where the key on the chain rests. His heart is beating the same as ever under his skin. He doesn't know how that can be true. It's a long stretch of silence before Henry shifts in the bed beside him and rolls onto his back, pulling a sheet over them. Alex reaches for something to say, but there's nothing. Alex wakes up alone. It takes a moment for everything to reorient around the fixed point in his chest where last night settled. The elaborate gilded headboard, the heavy embroidered duvet, the soft twill blanket beneath, that's the only thing in the room Henry actually chose. He slides his hand across the sheet, over to Henry's side of the bed. It's cool to the touch. Kensington Palace is gray and dull in the early morning. The clock on the mantelpiece says it's not even seven, and there's a violent rain lashing against the big picture window, half revealed by parted curtains. Henry's room has never felt much like Henry. But in the quiet of morning, he shows up in pieces. A pile of journals on the desk, the topmost splotched with ink from a pen exploding in his bag on a plane. An oversized cardigan, worn through and patched at the elbows, slung over an antique wingback chair near the window. David's leash hanging from the doorknob. And beside him, there's a copy of Le Monde, on the nightstand, tucked under a gigantic leather-bound volume of Wilde's complete works. He recognizes the date. Paris the first time they woke up next to each other. He squeezes his eyes shut, feeling for once in his life that he should stop being so damn nosy. 
It's time, he realizes, to start accepting only what Henry can give. The sheets smell like Henry. He knows, one, Henry isn't here. Two, Henry never said yes to any kind of future last night. Three, this could very well be the last time he gets to inhale Henry's scent on anything. But four, next to the clock on the mantel, Henry's ring still sits. The doorknob turns, and Alex opens his eyes to find Henry, holding two mugs and smiling a wan, unreadable smile. He's in soft sweats again, brushed with morning mist. Your hair in the mornings is truly a wonder to behold, is how he breaks the silence. He crosses and kneels on the edge of the mattress, offering Alex a mug. It's coffee, one sugar, cinnamon. He doesn't want to feel anything about Henry knowing how he likes his coffee. Not when he's about to be dumped. But he does. Except when Henry looks at him again, watches him take the first blessed sip of coffee, the smile comes back in earnest. He reaches down and palms one of Alex's feet through the duvet. Hi, Alex says carefully, squinting over his coffee. You seem... Less pissy. Henry huffs a laugh. <laughs> You're one to talk. I wasn't the one who stormed the palace in a fit of pique to call me an obtuse fucking asshole. In my defense, Alex says, you were an obtuse fucking asshole. Henry pauses, takes a sip of his tea, and places it on the nightstand. I was, he agrees and he leans forward and presses his mouth to Alex's, one hand steadying his mug so it doesn't spill. Alex isn't getting dumped after all. Hey, he says when Henry pulls back. Where were you? Henry doesn't answer, and Alex watches him kick his wet sneakers onto the floor before climbing up to sit between Alex's open legs. He places his hands on Alex's thighs, bracketing him with his full attention. And when he looks up into Alex's eyes, his are clear blue and focused. I needed to run, he says, to clear my head a bit, figure out what's next. Very Mr. Darcy brooding at Pemberley. And I ran into Philip. I hadn't mentioned it, but he and Martha are here for the week while they're doing renovations on Anmer Hall. He was up early for some appearance or other, eating toast, plain toast. Have you ever seen someone eat toast without anything on it? Harrowing, truly. Alex chews his lip. Where is this going, babe? We chatted for a bit. He didn't seem to know about your visitation last night, thankfully. But he was on about Martha and land holdings and the hypothetical heirs they have to start working on, even though Philip hates children. And suddenly it was as if, as if everything you said last night came back to me. I thought, God, that's it, isn't it? Just following the plan. And it's not that he's unhappy, he's fine. It's all very deeply fine. A whole lifetime of fine. He's been pulling at a thread on the duvet, but he looks back up, squarely into Alex's eyes, and says, That's not good enough for me. There's a desperate stutter in Alex's heartbeat. It's not? He reaches up and touches a thumb to Alex's cheekbone. I'm not good at thumb to Alex's cheekbone. I'm not good at saying these things like you are, but I've always thought, ever since I knew about me, and even before, when I could sense I was different, and after everything in the past few years, all the mad things my head does, I've always thought of myself as a problem that deserved to stay hidden. Never quite trusted myself or what I wanted. Before you, I was all right letting everything happen to me. I honestly have never thought I deserved to choose. His hand moves, fingertips brushing a curl behind Alex's ear. But you treat me like I do. There's something painfully hard in Alex's throat, but he pushes past it. He reaches over and sets his mug down next to Henry's on the nightstand. You do, 
he says. I think I'm actually beginning to believe that, Henry says. And I don't know how long it would have taken if I didn't have you to believe for me. And there's nothing wrong with you, Alex tells him. I mean, aside from the fact that you're occasionally an obtuse fucking asshole. Henry laughs again, wetly, his eyes crinkling up in the corners, and Alex feels his heart lift into his throat, up to the embellished ceilings, pushing out to fill the whole room all the way to the glinting gold ring still sitting above the fireplace. I'm sorry about that, Henry says. I, I wasn't ready to hear it. That night at the lake, it was the first time I let myself think you might actually say it. I panicked and it was daft and unfair, and I won't do it again. You better not, Alex tells him. So you're saying, saying, you're in? I'm saying, Henry begins, and the knit of his brow is nervous, but his mouth keeps speaking. I'm terrified, and my whole life is completely mad, but trying to give you up this week nearly killed me. And when I woke up this morning and looked at you, there's no trying to get by for me anymore. I don't know if I'll ever be allowed to tell the world, but I, I want to. One day, if there's any legacy for me on this bloody earth, I want it to be true. So I can offer you all of me, in whatever way you'll have me, and I can offer you the chance of a life. If you can wait, I want you to help me try. Alex looks at him, taking in the whole parcel of him, the centuries of royal blood sitting under an antique Kensington chandelier, and he reaches out to touch his face and looks at his fingers and thinks about holding the Bible at his mother's inauguration with the same hand. It hits him, fully, the weight of this, how completely neither of them will ever be able to undo it. Okay, he says. I'm into making history. Henry rolls his eyes and seals it with a smiling kiss, and they fall back into the pillows together. Henry's wet hair and sweatpants and Alex's naked limbs all tangled up in the lavish bedclothes. When Alex was a kid, before anyone knew his name, he dreamed of love like it was a fairy tale, as if it would come sweeping into his life on the back of a dragon one day. When he got older... He learned about love as a strange thing that could fall apart no matter how badly you wanted it. A choice you make anyway. He never imagined it'd turn out he was right, but and they make out lazily for hours or days, basking in the rare luxury of it. They take breaks to finish their lukewarm coffee and tea, and Henry has scones and black currant jam sent up. They waste away the morning in bed, watching Mel and Sue squawk over tea cakes on Henry's laptop, listening to the rain slow to a drizzle. At some point, Alex disentangles his jeans from the foot of the bed and fishes out his phone. He's got three missed calls from Zara, one ominous voicemail from his mother, and 47 unread messages in his group text with June and Nora. Alex, Z just told me you're in London? Alex, oh my God. I swear to God, if you do something stupid and get yourself caught, I'm gonna kill you myself. But you went after him. That's so Jane Austen. I'm gonna punch you in the face when you get back. I can't believe you didn't tell me. How did it go? Are you with Henry now? Gonna punch you. It turns out 46 out of 47 texts are June, and the 47th is Nora asking if either of them know where she left her white Chuck Taylors. Alex texts back. Your Chucks are under my bed, and Henry says hi. The message has barely delivered before his phone erupts with a call from June, who demands to be put on the speaker and told everything. After, rather than facing Zara's wrath himself, he convinces Henry to call Sean. Do you think you could, uh, phone Ms. Bankston and let her know Alex is safe and with me? Yes, sir, Sean says, and shall I arrange a car for his departure? Uh, Henry says, and he looks at Alex and mouths. Stay? Alex nods. Tomorrow? There's a very long pause over the line before Sean says, I'll let her know.
before Sean says, I'll let her know, in a voice like he'd rather do literally anything else. Alex laughs as Henry hangs up, but he returns to his phone again, to the voicemail waiting from his mother. Henry sees his thumb hovering over the play button and nudges his ribs. I suppose we do have to face the consequences at some point, he says. Alex sighs. I don't think I told you, but she, uh, well, when she fired me, she told me that if I wasn't a thousand percent serious about you, I needed to break things off. Henry nuzzles his nose behind Alex's ear. A thousand percent? Yeah, don't let it go to your head. Henry elbows him again, and Alex laughs and grabs his head and aggressively kisses his cheek, smashing his face into the pillow. When Alex finally relents, Henry is pink-faced and must and definitely pleased. I was thinking about that, though, Henry says. The chance being with me is going to keep ruining your career. Congress by 30, wasn't it? Come on, look at this face. People love this face. I'll figure out the rest. Henry looks deeply skeptical, and Alex sighs again. Look, I don't know. I don't even exactly know, like, how being a legislator would work if I'm with a prince of another country. So, you know, there's stuff to figure out. But way worse people with way bigger problems than me get elected all the time. Henry's looking at him in the piercing way he has sometimes that makes Alex feel like a bug stuck under a shadow box with a pushpin. You're really not frightened of what might happen. No, I mean, of course I am, he says. It definitely stays secret until after the election. And I know it'll be messy, but if we can get ahead of the narrative, wait for the right time to get ahead of the narrative, wait for the right time and do it on our own terms, I think it could be okay. How long have you been thinking about this? Consciously? Since, like, the DNC. Subconsciously, in total denial? A long-ass time. At least since you kissed me. Henry stares at him from the pillow. That's kind of incredible. What about you? What about me? Henry says. Christ, Alex. The whole bloody time. The whole time? Since the Olympics. The Olympics? Alex yanks Henry's pillow out from under him. But that's, that's like... Yes, Alex, the day we met. Nothing gets past you, does it? Henry says, reaching to steal the pillow back. What about you, he says, as if he doesn't know. Shut your mouth, Alex says, grinning like an idiot. And he stops fighting Henry for the pillow and instead straddles him and kisses him into the mattress. He pulls the blankets up and they disappear into the pile, a laughing mess of mouths and hands, until Henry rolls onto his phone and his ass presses the button on the voicemail. Diaz, you insane, hopeless, romantic little shit says the voice of the President of the United States, muffled in the bed. It had better be forever. Be safe. Sneaking out of the palace without security at two in the morning was, surprisingly, Henry's idea. He pulled hoodies and hats out for both of them, the incognito uniform of the internationally recognizable, and B staged a noisy exit from the opposite end of the palace where they sprinted through the gardens. Now they're on the deserted, wet pavement of South Kensington, flanked by tall, red brick buildings and a sunsort road. Oh my God, take a picture of me with a sign. Not there yet, Henry says over his shoulder. He gives Alex's arm another pull to keep him running. Keep moving, you wastrel. They cross to another street and duck into an alcove between two pillars while Henry fishes a key ring with dozens of keys out of his hoodie. Funny thing about being a prince, People will give you keys to just about anything if you ask nicely. Alex gawks, watching Henry feel around the edge of a seemingly plain wall. All this time I thought I was the Ferris Bueller of this relationship. What, did you think I was Sloane? Henry says, pushing the panel open a crack and yanking Alex into a wide, dark plaza. The grounds are sloping, white tiles carrying the sounds of their feet as they run. Sturdy Victorian bricks tower into the night, framing the courtyard, and Alex thinks, Oh, the Victoria and Albert Museum. Henry has a key to the V&A. 
There's a stout old security guard waiting at the doors. Can't thank you enough, Gavin, Henry says, and Alex notices the thick wad of cash Henry slips into their handshake. Renaissance City tonight, yeah, Gavin says. If you would be so kind, Henry tells him. And they're off again, hustling through rooms of Chinese art and French sculptures. Henry moves fluidly from room to room, past a black stone sculpture of a seated Buddha and John the Baptist, nude and in bronze, without a single false step. You do this a lot? Henry laughs. It's, a uh, sort of my little secret. When I was young, my mum and dad would take us early in the morning, before opening. They wanted us to have a sense of the arts, I suppose, but mostly history. He slows and points to a massive piece, a wooden tiger mauling a man dressed as a European soldier, the sign declaring, Tipu's Tiger, sign declaring, Tipu's Tiger. Mum would take us to look at this one and whisper to me, See how the great tiger is eating him up? That's because my great-great-great-great-granddad stole this from India. I think we should give it back, but your gran says no. Alex watches as Henry's face in quarter profile, the slight pain that moves under his skin. But he shakes it off quickly and takes Alex's hand back up. They're running again. Now I like to come at night, he says. A few of the higher-up security guards know me. Sometimes I think I keep coming because, no matter how many places I've been, or people I've met, or books I've read, this place is proof I'll never learn it all. It's like Westminster. You can look at every individual carving or pane of stained glass and know there's this wealth of stories there, that everything was put in a specific place for a reason. Everything has a meaning, an intention. There are pieces in here, the Great Bed of Ware. It's mentioned in Twelfth Night, Epicene, Don Juan, and it's here. Everything is a story, never finished. Isn't it incredible? And the archives, God, I could spend hours in the archives. They... Mm. He's cut off mid-sentence because Alex has stopped in the middle of the corridor and yanked him backward into a kiss. Hello, Henry says when they break apart. What was that for? I just like, Alex shrugs, really love you. The corridor dumps them out into a cavernous atrium, rooms sprawling out in each direction. Only some of the overhead lighting has been left on, and Alex can see an enormous chandelier looming high in the rotunda, tendrils and bubbles of glass in blues and greens and yellows. Behind it, there's an elaborate iron choir screen standing broad and gorgeous on the landing above. This is it, Henry says, pulling Alex by the hand to the- This is it, Henry says pulling Alex by the hand to the left, where light spills out of an immense archway. I called ahead to Gavin to make sure they left a light on. It's my favorite room. Alex has personally helped with exhibitions at the Smithsonian, and sleeps in a room once occupied by Ulysses S. Grant's father-in-law, but he still loses his breath when Henry pulls him through the marble pillars. In the half-light, the room is alive. The vaulted roof seems to stretch up forever into the inky London sky, and beneath it, the room is arranged like a city square somewhere in Florence, climbing columns and towering altars and archways. Deep basins of fountains are planted in the floor between statues on heavy pedestals, and effigies lie behind black doorways with a resurrection carved into their slate. Dominating the entire back wall is a colossal, gothic choir screen carved from marble and adorned with ornate statues of saints, black and gold and imposing. Holy. When Henry speaks again, it's soft, as if he's trying not to break the spell. In here, at night, it's almost like walking through a real piazza, Henry says. But there's nobody else around to touch you or gawk at you or try to steal a photo of you. You can just... B. Alex looks over to find Henry's expression careful, waiting, and he realizes this is the same as when Alex took Henry to the lake house, the most sacred place he has. He squeezes Henry's hand and says, Tell me everything. Henry does, leading him around to each piece in turn. There's a life size sculpture of Zephyr. The Greek god of the west wind brought to life Narcissus on his knees, mesmerized by his own reflection in the pool.
one thought to be Michelangelo's lost Cupid, but actually carved by Cioli. Do you see here where they had to repair his knuckles with stucco? Pluto stealing Proserpina away to the underworld, and Jason with his golden fleece. They wind up back at the first statue, Samson slaying a Philistine, the one that knocked the wind out of Alex when they walked in. He's never seen anything like it. The smooth muscles, the indentations of flesh, the breathing, bleeding life of it, all carved by Giambologna out of marble. If he could touch it, he swears the skin would be warm. It's a bit ironic, you know, Henry says, gazing up at it. Me, the cursed gay heir, standing here in Victoria's museum, considering how much she loved those sodomy laws. He smirks. Actually, you remember how I told you about the gay king, James I? The one with the dumb jock boyfriend? Yes, that one. Well, his most beloved favorite was a man named George Villiers, the handsomest bodied man in all of England, they called him. James was completely besotted. Everyone knew. This French poet, de Vion, wrote a poem about it. He clears his throat and starts to recite. One man fucks Monsieur Le Grand, another fucks the Comte de Tonnerre, and it is well known that the King of England fucks the Duke of Buckingham. Alex must be staring, because he adds, Well, it rhymes in French. Anyway, did you know the reason the King James translation of the Bible exists is because the Church of England was so displeased with James for flaunting his relationship with Villiers that he had the translation commissioned to appease them? You're kidding. He stood in front of the Privy Council and said, Christ had John, and had John, and I have George. Jesus? Precisely. Henry's still looking up at the statue but Alex can't stop looking at him and the sly smile on his face, lost in his own thoughts. And James's son, Charles I, is the reason we have dear Samson. It's the only Giambologna that ever left Florence. He was a gift to Charles from the King of Spain, and Charles gave it, this massive, absolutely priceless masterpiece of a sculpture, to Villiers. And a few centuries later, here he is one of the most beautiful pieces we own. And we didn't even steal it. We only needed Villiers and his trolloping ways with the queer monarchs. To me, if there were a registry of national gay landmarks in Britain, Samson would be on it. Henry's beaming like a proud parent, like Samson is his, and Alex is hit with a wave of pride and kind. He takes his phone out and lines up a shot. Henry standing there all soft and rumpled and smiling, next to one of the most exquisite works of art in the world. What are you doing? I'm taking a picture of a national gay landmark, Alex tells him, and also a statue. Henry laughs indulgently, and Alex closes the space between them, takes Henry's baseball cap off, and stands on his toes to kiss the ridge of his brow. It's funny, Henry says. I always thought of the whole thing as the most unforgivable thing about me. But you act like it's one of the best. Oh, yeah, Alex says. The top list of reasons to love you goes brain, then dick, then imminent status as a revolutionary gay icon. You are quite literally Queen Victoria's worst nightmare. And that's why you love me. My God, you're right. All this time I was just after the bloke who'd most inf- My God, you're right. All this time, I was just after the bloke who'd most infuriate my homophobic forebears. Ah, and we can't forget they were also racist. Certainly not, Henry nods seriously. Next time, we shall visit some of the George III pieces and see if they burst into flame. Through the marble choir screen at the back of the room is a second, deeper chamber, this one filled with church relics. Past stained glass and statues of saints, at the very end of the room, is an entire high altar chapel removed from its church. The sign explains its original setting was the apse of the convent church of Santa Chiara, in Florence, in the 15th century. And it's stunning, set deep into an alcove to create a real chapel, with statues of Santa Chiara and St. Francis of Assisi. When I was younger... Henry says, I had this very elaborate idea of taking somebody I loved here and standing inside the chapel, and he'd love it as much as I did, 
and we'd slow dance right in front of the Blessed Mother. Just a daft, pubescent fantasy. Henry hesitates before finally sliding his phone out of his pocket. He presses a few buttons and extends a hand to Alex. And quietly, your song starts to play from the tiny speaker. Alex exhales a laugh. Aren't you going to ask if I know how to waltz? No waltzing, Henry says. Never cared for it. Alex takes his hand, and Henry turns to face the chapel like a nervous postulant, his cheeks hollowed out in the low light, before pulling Alex into it. When they kiss, Alex can hear a half-remembered old proverb from catechism, mixed up between translations of the book. Come, hijo mío, de la miel, porque es buena, and the honeycomb, sweet, a lost David and Jonathan, turning slowly on the spot. He brings Henry's hand to his mouth and kisses the little knob of his knuckle, the skin over the blue vein there, bloodlines, pulses, the old blood kept in perpetuity within these walls, and he thinks, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Henry charters a private plane to get him back home, and Alex is dreading the dressing down he's going to get the minute he's stateside but he's trying not to think about it. At the airstrip, the wind whipping his hair across his forehead, Henry fishes inside his jacket for something. Listen, he says, pulling a curled fist out of his pocket. He takes one of Alex's hands and turns it to press something small and heavy into his palm. I want you to know, I'm sure, a thousand percent. He removes his hand, and there sitting in the center of Alex's calloused palm, is the signet ring. What? Alex's eyes flash up to search Henry's face and find him smiling softly. I can't keep it, Henry tells him. I'm sick of wearing it. It's a private airstrip, but it's still risky, so he folds Henry in a hug and whispers fiercely, I completely fucking love you. At cruising altitude, he takes the chain off his neck and slides the ring on next to the old house key. They clink together gently as he tucks them both under his shirt. Two homes, side by side. Chapter 11 Subject, Hometown Stuff From A. AGCD at eclair45.com September 2nd, 2020 5.12 p.m. To Henry. H. Have been home for three hours. Already miss you. This is some bullshit. Hey, have I told you lately that you're brave? I still remember what you said to that little girl in the hospital about Luke Skywalker. He's proof that it doesn't matter where you come from or who your family is. Sweetheart, you're proof too. By the way, in this relationship, I am absolutely the Han, and you are absolutely the Leia. Don't try to argue, because you'll be wrong. I was also thinking about Texas again, which I guess I do a lot when I'm stressed about election stuff. There's so much stuff I haven't shown you yet. We haven't even done Austin. I want to take you to Franklin Barbecue. You have to wait in line for hours, but that's part of the experience. I really want to see a member of the royal family wait in line for hours to eat cow parts. Have you thought any more about what you said before I left? About coming out to your family? Obviously, you're not obligated. You just seemed kind of hopeful when you talked about it. I'll be over here, still quarantined in the White House. At least Mom didn't kill me for London. Rooting for you. Love you. Kisses and hugs. A. P.S. Vita Sackville West to Virginia Woolf, 1927. With me, it is quite stark. I miss you even more than I could have believed, and I was prepared to miss you a good deal. Subject, re-hometown stuff. From Henry, hwales at kensingtonemail.com, September 3rd, 2020, 2.49 a.m., 2A. Alex, it is indeed bullshit. It's all I can do not to get a food sent up for me, and I'll be lurking in disguise in a shadowy corner when you answer the door. 
it'll all be very dreadfully Jane Eyre. The male will write mad speculations about where I've gone, if I've offed myself or vanished to St. Kilda. But only you and I will know that I'm just sprawled in your bed, reading books and feeding myself profiteroles and making love to you endlessly until we both expire in a haze of chocolate sauce. It's how I'd want to go. I'm afraid, though, I'm stuck here. Gran keeps asking Mum when I'm going to enlist, and did I know Philip had already served a year by the time he was my age? I do need to figure out what I'm going to do, because I'm certainly closing in on the end of what's an acceptable amount of time for a gap year. Please do keep me in your... What is it American politicians say? Thoughts and prayers. Austin sounds brilliant. Maybe in a few months, after things settle down a bit. I could take a long weekend. Can we visit your mum's house? Your room? Do you still have your lacrosse trophies? Tell me you still have posters up. Let me guess. Han Solo, Barack Obama, and... Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'll agree with your assessment that you're the Han to my lair, in that you are, without doubt, a scruffy-looking nerf herder who would pilot us into an asteroid field. I happen to like nice men. I have thought more about coming out to my family, which is part of why I'm staying here for now. B has offered to be there when I tell Philip if I want, so I think I will. Again, thoughts and prayers. I love you terribly, and I want you back here soon. I need your help picking a new bed for my room. I've decided to get rid of that gold monstrosity. Yours, Henry. P.S. From Radcliffe Hall to your old monstrosity. Yours, Henry. P.S. From Radcliffe Hall to Yevgenia Solene, 1934. Darling, I wonder if you realize how much I am counting on your coming to England, how much it means to me. It means all the world, and indeed my body shall be all, all yours, as yours will be all, all mine, beloved. And nothing will matter but just we two. We two longing loves at last come together. Subject. Re. Hometown Stuff. From A. AGCD at eclair45.com. September 3rd, 2020, 6.20 a.m. To Henry. H. Shit. Do you think you're going to enlist? I haven't done any research on it yet. I'm going to ask Zara to have one of our people put together a binder on it. What would that mean? Would you have to be gone a lot? Would it be dangerous? Or is it just like, wear the uniform and sit at a desk? How did we not talk about this when I was there? Sorry. I'm packing. I somehow forgot this was a thing looming on the horizon. I'm there for whatever you decide you want to do. Just like... Let me know if I need to start practicing gazing wistfully out the window, waiting for my love to return from the war. It drives me nuts, sometimes, that you don't get to have more say in your life. When I picture you happy, I see you with your own apartment somewhere outside of the palace, and a desk where you can write anthologies of queer history. And I'm there, using up your shampoo and making you come to the grocery store with me, and waking up in the same damn time zone with you every morning. When the election is over... We can figure out what we'll do next. I would love to be in the same place for a bit, but I know you have to do what you I believe in you. Re. Telling Philip sounds like a great plan. If all else fails, just do what I did and act like a huge jackass until most of your family figures it out on their own. Love you. Tell B hi. A. P.S. Eleanor Roosevelt to Lorena Hickok, 1933. I miss you greatly, dear. The nicest time of the day is when I write to you. You have a stormier time than I do, but I miss you as much, I think. Please keep most of your heart in Washington as long as I'm here, for most of mine is with you. Subject. Re. Hometown Stuff. From Henry. H. Wales at kensingtonemail.com. September 4, 2020. 7.58 p.m. 2A. Alex, have you ever had something go so horribly, horribly, unbelievably badly that you'd like to be loaded into a cannon and jettisoned into the merciless black maw of outer space? 
I wonder sometimes what is the point of me, or anything. I should have just packed a bag, like I said. I could be in your bed, languishing away until I perish, fat and sexually conquered, snuffed out in the spring of my youth. Here lies Prince Henry of Wales. He died as he lived, avoiding plans and sucking cock. I told Philip. Not about you, precisely. About me. Specifically, we were discussing enlistment, Philip and Sean and I, and I told Philip I'd rather not follow the traditional path, and that I hardly think I'd be useful to anyone in the military. He asked why I was so intent on disrespecting the traditions of the men of this family, and I truly think I dissociated straight, ha, huh, out of the conversation, because I opened my blasted very deeply gay, Philip. Once Sean managed to dislodge him from the chandelier, Philip had quite a few words for me some of which were confused or misguided and ensuring the perpetuity of the bloodline and respecting the legacy. Honestly, I don't recall much of it. Essentially, I gathered that he was not surprised to discover I am not the heterosexual heir I'm supposed to be, but rather surprised that I do not intend to keep pretending to be the heterosexual heir I'm supposed to be. So, yes. I know we discussed and hoped that coming out to my family would be a good first step. I cannot say this was an encouraging sign, re our odds of going public. I don't know. I've eaten a tremendous amount of Jaffa cakes about it, to be frank. Sometimes I imagine moving to New York to take over launching Pez's youth shelter there. Just leaving. Not coming back. Maybe burning something down on the way out. It would be nice. Here's an idea. Do you know I've realized I've never actually told you what I thought the first time we met? You see, for me, memories are difficult. Very often, they hurt. A curious thing about grief is the way it takes your entire life, all those foundational years that made you who you are, and makes them so painful to look back upon because of the absence there, that suddenly they're inaccessible. You must invent an entirely new system. I started to think of myself and my life and my whole lifetime worth of memories as all the dark, dusty rooms of Buckingham Palace. I took the night B left rehab, and I begged her to take it seriously, and I put it in a room with pink peonies on the wallpaper and a golden harp in the center of the floor. I took my first time with one of my brother's mates from uni when I was seventeen, and I found the smallest harp in the center of the floor. I took my first time with one of my brother's mates from uni when I was seventeen, and I found the smallest, most cramped little broom cupboard I could muster, and I shoved it in. I took my father's last night, the way his face went slack, the smell of his hands, the fever, the waiting and waiting and terrible waiting, and the even worse, not waiting any more. And I found the biggest room, a ballroom, wide open and dark windows drawn and covered. Locked the doors. But the first time I saw you, Rio, I took that down to the gardens. I pressed it into the leaves of a silver maple and recited it to the Waterloo vase. It didn't fit in any rooms. You were talking with Nora and June, happy and animated and fully alive, a person living in dimensions I couldn't access, and so beautiful. Your hair was longer then. You weren't even a president's son yet. But you weren't afraid. You had a yellow Ipe Amarello in your pocket. I thought, this is the most incredible thing I have ever seen. And I had better keep it a safe distance away from me. I thought, if someone like that ever loved me, it would set me on fire. And then I was a careless fool, and I fell in love with you anyway. When you rang me at truly shocking hours of the night, I loved you. When you kissed me in disgusting public toilets and pouted in hotel bars and made me happy in ways in which it had never even occurred to me that a mangled-up, locked-up person like me could be happy, I loved you. And then, inexplicably, you had the absolute audacity to love me back. Can you believe it? I'm sorry things didn't go better with Philip. I wish I could send hope. Yours, Henry. P.S. 
From Michelangelo to Tommaso Cavalieri, 1533. I know well that, at this hour, I could as easily forget your name as the food by which I live. Nay, it were easier to forget the food, which only nourishes my body miserably, than your name, which nourishes both body and soul, filling the one and the other with such sweetness that neither weariness nor fear of death is felt by me, while memory preserves you to my mind. Think, if the eyes could also enjoy their portion, in what condition I should find myself. Subject. Re. Hometown Stuff. From A. AGCD at eclair45.com. September 4th, 2020. 8.31 p.m. To Henry. H. Fuck. I'm so sorry. I don't know what else to say. I'm so sorry. June and Nora send their love. Not as much love as me, obviously. Please don't worry about me. We'll figure it out. It just might take time. I've been working on patience. I've picked up all kinds of things from you. God, what can I possibly write to make this better? Here. I can't decide if your emails make me miss you more or less. Sometimes I feel like a funny-looking rock in the middle of the most beautiful clear ocean when I read the kinds of things you write to me. You love so much bigger than yourself, bigger than everything. I can't believe how lucky I am to even witness it, to be the one who gets to have it, and so God made me to be the person you write those things about. I'll say five Hail Marys. Muchas gracias, Santa Maria. I can't match you for prose, but what I can do is write you a list. An incomplete list. Things I love about H.R.H. Prince Henry of Wales. 1. The sound of your laugh when I piss you off. 2. The way you smell underneath your fancy cologne, like clean linens but somehow also fresh grass. What kind of magic is this? 3. That thing you do where you stick out your chin to try to look tough. 4. How your hands look when you play piano. 5. All the things I understand about myself now because of you. 6. How you think Return of the Jedi is the best Star Wars. Wrong, because deep down you're a gigantic, sappy, embarrassing romantic who just wants the happily ever after. 7. Your ability to recite Keats. 8. Your ability to recite Bernadette's Don't Let It Drag You Down monologue from Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. 9. How hard you try. 10. How hard you've always tried. 11. How determined you are to keep trying. 12. That when your shoulders cover mine, nothing else in the entire stupid world matters. 13. The goddamn issue of Le Monde you brought back to London with you and kept and have on your nightstand. Yes, I saw it. 14. The way you look when you first wake up. 15. Your shoulder-to-waist ratio. 16. Your huge, generous, ridiculous, indestructible heart. 17. Your equally huge dick. Your huge, generous, ridiculous, indestructible heart. 17. Your equally huge dick. 18. The face you just made when you read that last one. 19. The way you look when you first wake up. I know I already said this, but I really, really love it. 20. The fact that you loved me all along. I was thinking about the last one ever since you told me. And what an idiot I was. It's so hard for me to get out of my own head sometimes. But now I'm coming back to what I said to you the night in my room when it all started, and how I brushed you off when you offered to let me go after the DNC. How I used to try to act like it was nothing sometimes. I didn't even know what you were offering to do to yourself. God, I want to fight everyone who's ever hurt you. But it was me too, wasn't it? All that time. I'm so sorry. Please stay gorgeous and strong and unbelievable. I miss you, I miss you, I miss you, I love you. 
I'm calling you as soon as I send this. But I know you like to have these things written down. A. P.S. Richard Wagner to Elisa Villa, re Ludwig II, 1864. Remember when you played Wagner for me? He's an asshole, but this is something. It is true that I love my young king who genuinely adores me. You cannot form an idea of our relations. I recall one of the dreams of my youth. I once dreamed that Shakespeare was alive, that I really saw and spoke to him. I can never forget the impression that dream made on me. Then I would have wished to see Beethoven, though he was already dead. Something of the same kind must believe that he really possesses me. None can read without astonishment, without enchantment, the letters he writes to me. Chapter 12 there's a diamond ring on Zara's finger when she shows up with her coffee thermos and a thick stack of files. They're in June's room, scarfing down breakfast before Zara and June leave for a rally in Pittsburgh, and June drops her waffle on the bedspread. Oh my God, Z, what is that? Did you get engaged? Zara looks down at the ring and shrugs. I had the weekend off. June gapes at her. When are you going to tell us who you're dating? Alex asks. Also, how? Uh-uh, nope, she says. You don't get to say shit to me about secret relationships in and around this campaign, princess. Point, Alex concedes. She brushes past the topic as June starts wiping syrup off the bed with her pajama pants. We've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, so focus up, little Claremonts. She's got detailed agendas for each of them, bullet-pointed and double-sided, and she dives right in. They're already on Thursday's voter registration drive in Cedar Rapids. Alex is pointedly not invited, when her phone pings with a notification. She picks it up, scrolling through the screen offhandedly. So, I need both of you to be dressed and ready by... She looks more closely at the screen, distracted. By, uh... Her face is taken over with a horrified gasp. Oh, fuck my ass. What? Alex starts, but his own phone buzzes in his lap, and he looks down to find a push notification from CNN. Leaked surveillance footage shows Prince Henry at DNC Hotel. Shoulder. Somehow, some anonymous source got the security camera footage from the lobby of the Beekman that night of the DNC. It's not explicitly damning, but it very clearly does show the two of them walking out of the bar together, shoulder to shoulder, flanked by cash, and it cuts to footage from the elevator, Henry's arm around Alex's waist while they talk with cash. It ends with the three of them getting off together at the top floor. Zara looks up at him, practically murderous. Can you explain to me why this one day of our lives will not stop haunting me? I don't know, Alex says miserably. I can't believe this is the one that's... I mean... We've done riskier things than this. That's supposed to make me feel better how? I just mean, like, who is leaking fucking elevator tapes? Who's checking for that? It's not like Solange was in there. A chirp from June's phone interrupts him, and she swears when she looks at it. Jesus, that post reporter just texted to ask for a comment on the speculation surrounding your relationship with Henry and whether it... whether it has to do with you leaving the campaign after the DNC. She looks between Alex and Zara, eyes wide. This is really bad, isn't it? It ain't great, Zara says. She's got her nose buried in the phone, furiously typing out, Us be a gay beard. I have an idea, June finally half shouts. When they both look at her, she's biting her lip, looking at Alex. But I don't know if you're gonna like it. She turns her phone around to show them the screen. It's a photo he recognizes as one of the ones they took for Pez in Texas, June and Henry lounging on the dock together. She's cropped Nora out, so it's just the two of them, Henry sporting a wide, teasing grin under his sunglasses, and June planting a kiss on his cheek. I was on that floor too, she says. We don't have to, like, confirm or deny anything, but we can imply something, just to take the heat off. Alex swallows. 
He's always known June was one inch from taking a bullet for him. But this? He would never ask her to do this. But the thing is, it would work. Their social media friendship is well documented, even if half of it is gifs of Colin Firth. Out of context, the photo looks as couple as anything, like a nice, gorgeous, heterosexual couple on vacation together. He looks over to Zara. It's not a bad idea, Zara says. We'd have to get Henry on board. Can you do that? Alex releases a breath. He absolutely doesn't want this, but he's also not sure what other choice he has. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. This is exactly what we said we didn't want to do, Alex says into his phone. I know, Henry tells him across the line. His voice is shaky. Philip is waiting on Henry's other line. But. Yeah, he looks over to Zara. It's not a bad idea, Zara says. We'd have to get Henry on board. Can you do that? Alex releases a breath. He absolutely doesn't want this, but he's also not sure what other choice he has. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. This is exactly what we said we didn't want to do, Alex says into his phone. I know, Henry tells him across the line. His voice is shaky. Philip is waiting on Henry's other line. But. Yeah, Alex says. But. June posts the picture from Texas, and it immediately burns through her stats to become her new most liked post. Within hours, it's everywhere. BuzzFeed puts up a comprehensive guide to Henry and June's relationship, leading off with that goddamn photo of them dancing at the royal wedding. They dig up photos from the night in L.A., analyze Twitter interactions. Just when you thought June Claremont Diaz couldn't get any more hashtag goals, one article writes, has she secretly had her own Prince Charming all along? Another one speculates, did HRH's best friend Alex introduce them? June's relieved, only because she managed to find a way to protect him, even though it means the world is digging through her life for answers and evidence, which makes Alex want to murder everyone. He also wants to grab people by the shoulders and shake them and tell them Henry is his, you idiots, even though the whole point of this was for it to be believable. He shouldn't feel wronged deep in his gut, but that everyone seems enamored when the only difference between the lie and the truth that would burn up Fox News is the gender involved. Well, it fucking stings. Henry is quiet. He says Henry has finally found himself a girlfriend. Alex feels horrible about it. The stifling orders, pretending to be someone he's not. Alex has always tried to be a refuge for Henry from it all. It was never supposed to come from his side, too. It's bad. It's stomach cramps, walls closing in, no plan B if this fails bad. He was in London barely two weeks ago, kissing Henry in front of a jambologna. Now this. There's another piece in their back pocket that'll sell it. The only relationship in his life that can get more mileage than any of this. Nora comes to him at the residence wearing bright red lipstick and presses cool, patient fingers against his temples and says, Take me on a date. They choose a college neighborhood full of people who sneak shots on their phones and post them everywhere. Nora slides her hand into his back pocket, and he tries to focus on the comfort of her physical presence against his side, the familiar frizz of her curls against his cheek. For half a second, he allows a small part of him to think about how much easier things would be if this were the truth. Sliding back into comfortable, easy harmony with his best friend leaving greasy fingerprints along her waistline outside Jumbo Slice, laughing at her crass jokes. If he could love her like people wanted him to, and she loved him, and there wasn't any more to it than that. But she doesn't, and he can't. And his heart is on a plane over the Atlantic right now, coming to D.C. to seal the deal over a well-photographed lunch with June the next day. Zara sends him an email full of Twitter threads about him and Nora that night when he's in bed. 
and he feels sick. Henry lands in the middle of the night and isn't even allowed to come near the residence. Exhausted when he calls in the morning, and Alex holds the phone close and promises he'll try to find a way to see him before he flies back out. Please, Henry says, paper thin. His mother, the rest of the administration, and half of the press at this point are caught up for the day dealing with news of a North Korean missile test. Nobody notices when June lets him climb into her SUV with her that morning. June holds onto his elbow and makes half-hearted jokes, and when they pull up a block from the cafe, she offers him an apologetic smile. I'll tell him you're here, she says. If nothing else, maybe that'll make it a little easier for him. Thanks, he says. Before she opens the door to leave, he catches her by the wrist and says, seriously, thank you. She gives his hand a squeeze, and she and Amy are gone. And he's alone in a tiny, secluded alleyway with a second car of backup security and a twisted-up feeling in his stomach. It takes all of an hour before June texts him, All done. Followed by, Bringing him to you. They worked it out before they left. Amy brings June and Henry back to the alley. They have him swap cars like a political prisoner. Alex leans forward to the two agents sitting silently in the front seats. He doesn't know if they've figured out what this really is yet, and he honestly doesn't care. Hey, can I have a minute? They exchange a look but get out, and a minute later, there's another car alongside him, and the door is opening. And he's there, Henry, looking tense and unhappy, but within arm's reach. Alex pulls him in by the shoulder on instinct, the door shutting behind him. He holds him there and this close he can see the faint gray tinge to Henry's complexion, the way his eyes aren't connecting. It's the worst he's ever seen him, worse than a vent. Hey, Alex says. Henry's gaze is still unfocused, and Alex shifts toward the middle of the seat and into his line of vision. Hey, look at me. Hey, I'm right here. Henry's hands are shaking, his breath's coming shallow, and Alex knows the signs the low hum of an impending panic attack. He reaches down and wraps his hand around one of Henry's wrists, feeling the racing pulse under his thumbs. Henry finally meets his eyes. I hate it, he says. I hate this. I know, Alex says. It was tolerable before, somehow, Henry says. When there was never... Never the possibility of anything else. But Christ, this is... It's vile. It's a bloody farce. And June and Nora... What? They just get to be used? Gran wanted me to bring my own photographers for this. Did you know that? He inhales, and it gets caught in his throat and shudders violently on the way back out. Alex, I don't want to do this. I know. Alex tells him again, reaching up to smooth out Henry's brow with a pat of his thumb. I know. I hate it too. It's not fucking fair, he goes on, his voice nearly breaking. My shit ancestors walking around doing a thousand times worse than any of this, and nobody cared. Baby, Alex says, moving his hand to Henry's chin to bring him back down. I know. I'm so sorry, babe. But it won't be like this forever, okay? I promise. Henry closes his eyes and exhales through his nose. I want to believe you. I do. But I'm so afraid. Henry closes his eyes and exhales through his nose. I want to believe you. I do. But I'm so afraid I'll never be allowed. Alex wants to go to war for this man. Wants to get his hands on everything and everyone that ever hurt him. But for once, he's trying to be the steady one. So he rubs the side of Henry's neck gently, until his eyes drift back open and he smiles softly, tipping their foreheads together. Hey, he says. I'm not going to let that happen. Listen, I'm telling you right now. I will physically fight your grandmother myself if I have to, okay? And like she's old, I know I can take her. I wouldn't be so cocky. Henry says with a small laugh. She's full of dark surprises. 
Alex laughs, cuffing him on the shoulder. Seriously, he says. Henry's looking back at him, beautiful and vital and heartsick, and still always the person Alex is willing to risk ruining his life for. I hate this so much. I know. But we're going to do it together. And we're going to make it work. You and me and history. Remember? We're just going to fucking fight. Because you're it, okay? I'm never going to love anybody in the world like I love you. So I promise you, one day we'll be able to just be and fuck everyone else. He pulls Henry in by the nape of his neck and kisses him hard. Henry's knee knocking against the center console as his hands move up to Alex's face. Even though the windows are tinted black, it's the closest they've ever come to kissing in public. And Alex knows it's reckless, but all he can think is a supercut of other people's letters they've quietly sent to each other. History. Meet you in every dream. Keep most of your heart in Washington. Miss you like a home. We two longing loves. My young king. One day, he tells himself. One day. Us two. The anxiety feels like buzzing little wings in his ear, in the silence, like a petulant wasp. It catches him when he tries to sleep and startles him awake, follows him on laps paced up and down the floors of the residence. It's getting harder to brush off the feeling he's being watched. The worst part is that there's no end in sight. They'll definitely have to keep it up at least until the election is over. And even then, there's the always looming possibility of the queen outright forbidding it. His idealistic streak won't let him fully accept it. But that doesn't mean it isn't there. He keeps waking up in D.C., and Henry keeps waking up in London, and the whole world keeps waking up to talk about the two of them in love with other people. Pictures of Nora's hand in his, speculation about whether June will get an official announcement of royal courtship, and the two of them, Henry and Alex, like the world's worst illustration of the symposium, split down the middle and sent bleeding into separate lives. Even that thought depresses him, because Henry's the only reason he's become a person who cites Plato. Henry and his classics, Henry in his palace, in love, in misery. Not talking much anymore. Even with both of them trying as hard as they are, it's impossible to feel like it's not pulling them apart. The whole charade takes and takes from them, takes days that were sacred. The night in L.A., the weekend at the lake, the missed chance in Rio, and records over the tape with something more palatable. The ne and definitely not ever each other. He doesn't want Henry to know. Henry has a hard enough time as it is, looked at sideways by his whole family. Philip, who knows and has not been kind. He tries to sound calm and whole over the phone when they talk, but he doesn't think it's convincing. When he was younger and the anxiety got this bad, when the stakes in his life were much, much lower, this would be the point of self-destruction. If he were in California, he'd sneak the Jeep out and drive way too fast down the 101, doors off, blasting NWA, inches from being painted on the pavement. In Texas, he'd steal a bottle of Makers from the liquor cabinet and get wasted with half the lacrosse team, and maybe, afterward, climb through Liam's window and hope to forget by morning. The first debate is in a matter of weeks. He doesn't even have work to keep him busy, so he stews and stresses and goes for long, punishing runs until he has the satisfaction of blisters. He wants to set himself on fire, but he can't afford for anyone to see him burn. He's returning a box of borrowed files to his dad's office in the Dirksen building after hours when he hears the faint sound of muddy waters from the floor above. And it hits him. There's one person he can burn down instead. He finds Rafael Luna hunched at his office's open window, sucking down a cigarette. There are two empty, crumpled packs of Marlboros next to a lighter and an overflowing ashtray on the sill. When he turns around at the slam of the door, he coughs out a startled cloud of smoke. Those things are going to fucking kill you, Alex says. He said the same thing about 500 times that summer in Denver, 
but now he means, I kind of wish they would. Same thing about 500 times that summer in Denver, but now he means, I kind of wish they would. Kid, don't call me that. Luna turns, stubbing out his cigarette in the ashtray, and Alex can see a muscle clenching in his jaw. As handsome as he always is, he looks like shit. You shouldn't be here. No shit, Alex says. I just wanted to see if you would have the balls to actually talk to me. You do realize you're talking to a United States senator, he says placidly. Yeah, big fucking man, Alex says. He's advancing on Luna now, kicking a chair out of the way. Important fucking job. Hey, how about you tell me how you're serving the people who voted for you by being Jeffrey Richards' chicken shit little sellout? What the hell did you come here for, Alex, eh? Luna asks him, unmoved. You gonna fight me? I want you to tell me why. His jaw clenches again. You wouldn't understand. You're... I swear to God, if you say I'm too young, I'm gonna lose my shit. This isn't you losing your shit? Luna asks mildly. And the look that crosses Alex's face must be murderous, because he immediately puts a hand up. Okay. Bad timing. Look, I know. I know it seems shitty, but there's... There are moving parts at work here that you can't even imagine. You know, I'll always be indebted to your family for what you all have done for me. But I don't give a shit about what you owe us. I trusted you, he says. Don't condescend to me. You know as much as anyone what I'm capable of, what I've seen. If you told me, I would get it. He's so close, he's practically breathing Luna's reeking cigarette smoke. And when he looks into his face, there's a flicker of recognition at the bloodshot, blackened eyes and the gaunt cheekbone. It reminds him of how Henry looked in the back of the Secret Service car. Does Richards have something on you? He asks. Is he making you do this? Luna hesitates. I'm doing this because it's what needs to be done, Alex. It was my choice. Nobody else's. Then tell me why. Luna takes a deep breath and says, No. Alex imagines his fist in Luna's face and removes himself by two steps, out of range. You remember that night in Denver? He says, measured, his voice quavering. When we ordered pizza, and you showed me pictures of all the kids you fought for in court, and we drank that nice bottle of scotch from the mayor of Boulder. I remember lying on the floor of your office on the ugly-ass carpet, drunk off my ass, thinking, God, I hope I can be like him. Because you were brave. Because you stood up for things. And I couldn't stop wondering how you had the nerve to get up and do what you do every day with everyone knowing what they know about you. Briefly, Alex thinks he's gotten through to Luna. From the way he closes his eyes and braces himself against the sill, but when he faces Alex again, his stare is hard. People don't know a damn thing about me. They don't know the half of it. And neither do you, he says. Jesus, Alex, please don't be like me. Find another fucking role model. Alex, finally at his limit, lifts his chin and spits out. I already am like you. It hangs in the air between them as physical as the kicked-over chair. Luna blinks. What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. I think you always knew, before I eaved off. You're not like me. Alex levels his stare. Close enough. And you know what I mean. Okay, fine, kid. Luna finally snaps. You want me to be your fucking Sherpa? Here's my advice. Don't tell anyone. Go find a nice girl and marry her. You're luckier than me. You can do that, and it wouldn't even be a lie. And what comes out of Alex's mouth comes so fast he has no chance to stop it, only divert it out of English at the last second in case it's overheard. Sería una mentira, porque no sería él. It would be a lie, because it wouldn't be him. He knows immediately Raf has caught his meaning because he takes a sharp step backward, his back hitting the sill again. You can't tell me this shit, Alex, 
he says, clawing inside his jacket until he finds and removes another pack of cigarettes. He shakes one out and fumbles with a lighter. What are you even thinking? I'm on the opponent's fucking campaign. I can't hear this. How can you possibly think you can be a politician like this? Who fucking decided that politics had to be about lying and hiding and being something you're not? It's always been that, Alex. Since when did you buy into it? Alex spits. You, me, my family, the people we run with. We were going to be the honest ones. I have absolutely zero interest in being a politician with some perfect veneer and 2.5 kids. Didn't we decide it was supposed to be about helping people, about the fight? What part of that is so fucking irreconcilable with letting people see who I really am? Who you are, Raph? Alex, please, please, Jesus Christ, you have to leave. I can't know this. You can't tell me this. You have to be more careful than this. God, Alex says, voice bitter, his hands on his hips. God, Alex says, voice bitter, his hands on his hips. You know, it's worse than trust. I believed in you. I know you did, Luna says. He's not even looking at Alex anymore. I wish you hadn't. Now I need you to get out. Raph, Alex, get out. He goes, slamming the door behind him. Back at the residence, he tries to call Henry. He doesn't pick up, but he texts, Sorry, meeting with Philip. Love you. He reaches under the bed and gropes in the dark until he finds it. A bottle of Makers. The emergency stash. Salud, he mutters under his breath. And he unscrews the top. Subject. Bad Metaphors About Maps. From A. AGCD at eclair45.com. September 25th, 2020. 321 AM. To Henry. H. I have had whiskey. Bear with me. There's this thing you do. This thing. It drives me crazy. I think about it all the time. There's a corner of your mouth and a place that it goes, pinched and worried, like you're afraid you're forgetting something. I used to hate it. I used to think it was your little tick of disapproval. But I've kissed your mouth, that corner, that place it goes so many times now. I've memorized it. Topography on the map of you. A world I'm still charting. I know it. I added it to the key. Here, here. Inches to miles. I can multiply it out. Read your latitude and longitude. Recite your coordinates like La Rosaria. This thing. Your mouth. Its place. It's what you do when you're trying not to give yourself away. Not in the way that you do all the time, those empty, greedy grabs for you. I mean, the truth of you. The weird, perfect shape of your heart. The one on the outside of your chest. On the map of you, my fingers can always find the green hills. Whales. Cool waters and a shore of white chalk. The ancient part of you carved out of stone in a prayerful circle. Sacrosanct. Your spine's a ridge I'd die climbing. If I could spread it out on my desk, I'd find the corner of your mouth where it pinches with my fingers, and I'd smooth it away, and you'd be marked with the names of saints like all the old maps. I get the nomenclature now. Saints' names belong to miracles. Give yourself away sometimes, sweetheart. There's so much of you. Fucking yours. A. P.S. Wilfred Owen to Siegfried Sassoon, 1917. And you have fixed my life, however short. You did not light me. I was always a mad comet. But you have fixed me. I spun round you a satellite for a month, but shall swing out soon. A dark star in the orbit where you will blaze. Subject. Re, bad metaphors about maps. From Henry, hwales at kensingtonemail.com, 
September 25th, 2020, 6.07 a.m., Marais, 1939. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for having saved me. I was drowning, and you threw yourself into the water without hesitation, without a backward look. The sound of Alex's phone buzzing on his nightstand startles him out of a dead sleep. He falls halfway out of bed, fumbling to answer it. Hello? What did you do? Zara's voice nearly shouts. By the clicking of heels in the background and muttering swearing, she's running somewhere. Um, Alex says. He rubs his eyes, trying to get his brain back online. What did he do? Be more specific? Check the fucking news, you horny little miscreant. How could you possibly be stupid enough to get photographed? I swear to God. Alex doesn't even hear the last part of what she says because his stomach has just dropped all the way down through the floor and into the fucking basements two floors below. Fuck. Hands shaking, he switches Zara to speaker, opens up Google, and types his own name. Breaking. Photos reveal romantic relationship between Prince Henry and Alex Claremont Diaz. OMFG. F. Sotis and Prince Henry totally doing it. The Oral Office. Read F. Sotis's steamy emails to Prince Henry. Royal Family declines to comment on reports of Prince Henry's relationship with First Son. Twenty-five gifs that perfectly describe our reaction when we heard about Prince Henry and F. Sotis. Don't let First Son go down on me. A bubble of hysterical laughter emerges from his throat. His bedroom door flies open and Zara slams on the light. A steely expression of rage barely concealing the sheer slams on the light. A steely expression of rage barely concealing the sheer terror on her face. Alex's brain flashes to the panic button behind his headboard and wonders if the Secret Service will be able to find him before he bleeds out. You're on communications lockdown, she says. And instead of punching him, she snatches his phone out of his hand and shoves it down the front of her blouse, which has been buttoned wrong in her rush. She doesn't even blink at his state of half-nakedness, just dumps an armload of newspapers onto his bedspread. Queen Henry, 20 copies of the Daily Mail proclaim in gigantic letters, inside the prince's gay affair with the first son of the United States. The cover is splashed with a blown-up photo of what is undeniably himself and Henry kissing in the back seat of the car behind the cafe, apparently shot with a long-range lens through the windshield. Tinted windows. But he forgot about the fucking windshield. Two smaller photos are inset on the bottom of the page. One of the shots of them on the Beekman's elevator, and a photo of them side by side at Wimbledon, him whispering something in Henry's ear while Henry smiles a soft, private smile. Fucking shedding hell. He is so fucked. Henry is so fucked, and Jesus Christ, his mother's campaign is fucked, and his political career is fucked, and his ears are ringing, and he's going to throw up. Fuck, Alex says again. I need my phone. I have to call Henry. No, you do fucking not, Zara says. We don't know yet how the emails got out, so it's radio silence until we find the leak. The... what? Is Henry okay? God, Henry... All he can think about is Henry's big blue eyes looking terrified, Henry's breathing coming shallow and quick, locked in his bedroom in Kensington Palace and desperately alone, and his jaw desperately alone, and his jaw locks up, something burning in the back of his throat. The president is sitting down right now with as many members of the Office of Communications as we could drag out of bed at three in the morning, Zara tells him, ignoring his question. Her phone is buzzing nonstop in her hand. It's about to be gay DEFCON 5 in this administration. For God's sake, put some clothes on. Zara disappears into Alex's closet, and he flips the newspaper open to the story, his heart pounding. There are even more photos inside. He glances over the copy, but there's too much to even begin to process. On the second page, he sees them. Printed and annotated excerpts of their emails. One is labeled, Prince Henry. Secret poet? It begins with a line he's read about a thousand times by now. Should I tell you that when we're apart, 
your body comes back to me in dreams. Fuck, he says a third time, spiking the newspaper at the floor. That one was his. It feels obscene to see it there. How the fuck did they get these? Yep, Zara agrees. You dirty did it. She throws a white button down and a pair of jeans at him, and he pitches himself out of bed. Zara gamely holds out an arm for him to steady himself while he pulls his pants up, and despite it all, he's struck with overwhelming gratitude for her. Listen, I need to talk to Henry as soon as possible. I can't even imagine. God, I need to talk to him. Get some shoes, we're running, Zara tells him. Priority one is damage control, not feelings. He grabs a pair of sneakers, and they take off while he's still pulling them on, running west. His brain is struggling to keep up, running through about 5,000 possible ways this could go, imagining himself 10 years down the road being frozen out of Congress, plummeting approval ratings, disapproval of him. He's so screwed, and he can't even decide who to be angriest with, himself, or the male, or the monarchy, or the whole stupid country. He nearly crashes into Zara's back as she skids to a stop in front of a door. He pushes the door open, and the whole room goes silent. His mother stares at him from the head of the table and says flatly, Out. At first, he thinks she's talking to him, but she cuts her eyes down to the people around the table with her. Was I not clear? Everyone out now, she says. I need to talk to my son. Chapter 13 Sit down, his mother tells him, and Alex feels dread coiled deep in his stomach. He has no clue what to expect. Knowing your parent as the person who raised you isn't the same as being able to guess their moves as a world leader. He sits, and the silence hovers over them, his mother's hands folded in a considering pose against her lips. She looks exhausted. Are you okay? She says finally. When he looks up in surprise, there's no anger in her eyes. The president stands on the edge of a career-ending scandal, measures her breath evenly, and waits for her son to answer. Oh. It hits him with sudden clarity that he hasn't at all stopped to consider his own feelings. There simply hasn't been the time. When he reaches for an emotion to name, he finds he can't pin one down. And something shudders inside him and shuts down completely. He doesn't often wish away his position in life, but in this moment he does. He wants to be having this conversation in a he wants to be having this conversation in a different life, just his mother sitting across from him at the dinner table, asking him how he feels about his nice, respectable boyfriend, if he's doing okay with figuring his identity out. Not like this, in a West Wing briefing room, his dirty email spread out between them on the table. I'm, he begins. To his horror, he hears something shake in his voice, which he quickly swallows down. I don't know. This isn't how I wanted to tell people. I thought we'd get a chance to do this right. Something softens and resolves in her face and he suspects he's answered a question for her beyond the one she asked. She reaches over and covers one of his hands with her own. You listen to me, she says. Her jaw is set, ironclad. It's the game face he's seen her use to stare down Congress, to cow autocrats. Her grip on his hand is steady and strong. He wonders, half hysterically, if this is how it felt to charge into war under Washington. I am your mother. I was your mother before I was ever the president, and I'll be your mother long after, to the day they put me in the ground and beyond this earth. You are my child. So, if you're serious about this, I'll back your play. Alex is silent. But the debates, he thinks, but the general... Her gaze is hard. He knows better than to say either of those things. She'll handle it. So, she says, do you feel forever about him? And there's no room left to agonize over it. Nothing left to do but say the thing he's known all along. 
Yeah, he says. Yeah, he says. I do. Ellen Claremont exhales slowly, and she grins a small, secret grin, the crooked, unflattering one she never uses in public, the one he knows best from when he was a kid around her knees in a small kitchen in Travis County. Then fuck it. The Washington Post As details emerge about Alex Claremont Diaz's affair with Prince Henry, White House goes silent. September 27th, 2020. Thinking about history makes me wonder how I'll fit into it one day, I guess. First son Alex Claremont Diaz writes in one of the many emails to Prince Henry published by the Daily Mail this morning. And you too. It seems the answer to that question may have come sooner than any anticipated with a sudden exposure of the first son's romantic relationship with Prince Henry, an arrangement with major repercussions for two of the world's most powerful nations, less than two months before the United States casts its vote on President Claremont's second term. As security experts within the FBI and the Claremont administration scrambled to find the sources that provided the British tabloid with evidence of the affair, the usually high-profile first family has shuttered, with no official statement from the first son. The first family has always and continues to keep their personal lives separate from the political and diplomatic dealings of the presidency. White House Press Secretary David Sutherland said in a brief, prepared statement this morning, they ask for patience and understanding from the American people as they handle this very private matter. The Daily Mail's report this morning revealed that first son Alex Claremont Diaz has been involved romantically and sexually with Prince Henry since at least February of this year, according to emails and photographs of leaks under the moniker The Waterloo Letters, seemingly named for a reference to the Waterloo vase in the Buckingham Palace Gardens in one email composed by Prince Henry. The correspondence continues regularly up to Sunday night and appears to have been lifted from a private email server used by residents of the White House. Setting aside the ramifications for President Claremont's ability to be impartial on issues of both international relations and traditional family values, Republican presidential candidate Senator Jeffrey Richards said at a press conference earlier today, I'm extremely concerned about this private email server. What kind of information was being disseminated on this server? Richards added that he believes the American voters have a right to know everything else for which President Claremont's server may have been used. Sources close to the Claremont administration insist the private server is similar to the one set up during President George W. Bush's administration and used only for communication within the White House about day-to-day -day operations and personal correspondence for the first family and core White House personnel. First round of examination of the Waterloo letters by experts have yet to reveal any evidence of classified information or otherwise compromising content outside of the nature of the first son's relationship with Prince Henry. For five endless, unbearable hours, Alex is shuffled from room to room in the West Wing, meeting with what seemed to be every strategist, press staffer, and crisis manager his mother's administration has to offer. The only moment he recalls with any clarity is pulling his mother into an alcove to say, I told Raph. She stares at him. You told Raphael Luna that you're bisexual? I told Raphael Luna about Henry he says flatly, two days ago. She doesn't ask why, just sighs grimly, and they both hover over the, impli hover over the implication before she says, No, no, these pictures were taken before that. It couldn't have been him. He runs through pro and con lists, models of different outcomes, fucking charts and graphs and more data than he has ever wanted to see about his own relationship and its ramifications for the world around him. This is the damage you cause, Alex, it all seems to say, right there in hard facts and figures. This is who you hurt. He hates himself, but he doesn't regret anything. And maybe that makes him a bad person and a worse politician, but he doesn't regret Henry. For five endless, unbearable hours, he's not allowed to even try to contact Henry. The press sec drafts a statement. It looks like any other memo. For five hours, he doesn't shower or change his clothes or laugh or smile or cry. 
It's eight in the morning when he's finally released and told to stay in the residence and stand by for further instructions. He's handed his phone, at last, but there's no answer when he calls Henry, and no response when he texts. Nothing at all. Amy walks with him through the colonnade and up the stairs, saying nothing, and when they reach the hallway between the east and west bedrooms, he sees them. June, her hair in a haphazard knot on the top of her head and in a pink bathrobe, her eyes red-rimmed. His mom, in a sharp, no-nonsense black dress and pointed heels, jaw set. Leo, barefoot in his pajamas, and his dad, a leather duffel still hanging off one shoulder, looking harried and exhausted. They all turn to look at him, and Alex feels a wave of something so much bigger than himself sweep over him, like when he was a child standing bow-legged in the Gulf of Mexico, riptide sucking at his feet. Standing bow-legged in the Gulf of Mexico, riptide sucking at his feet. A sound escapes his throat uninvited, something that he barely even recognizes, and June has him first, then the rest of them, arms and arms and hands and hands, pulling him close and touching his face and moving him until he's on the floor. The goddamn terrible, hideous, antique rug that he hates, sitting on the floor and staring at the rug and the threads of the rug and hearing the gulf rushing in his ears and thinking distantly that he's having a panic attack. And that's why he can't breathe. But he's just staring at the rug. And he's having a panic attack, and knowing why his lungs won't work doesn't make them work again. He's faintly aware of being shifted into his room, to his bed, which is still covered in the godforsaken fucking newspapers. And someone guides him onto it. And he sits down and tries very hard to make a list in his head. One. 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 He sleeps in fits and starts, wakes up sweating, wakes up shivering, his dreams in short, fractured scenes that swell and fade erratically. He dreams of himself at war, in a muddy trench, love letters soaking red in his chest pocket. He dreams of a house in Travis County, doors locked, unwilling to let him in again. He dreams of a crown. He dreams once, briefly, of the lake house, an orange beacon under the moon. He sees himself there, standing in water up to his neck. He sees Henry sitting naked on the pier. He sees June and Nora, hands clasped together, and Pez on the grass between them, and B, digging pink fingertips into the wet soil. In the trees next to them, he hears the snap snap pointing up at the stars, and Alex tries to say, Don't you hear it? tries to say, something's coming. He opens his mouth, a spill of fireflies, and nothing. When he opens his eyes, June is sitting up against the pillows next to him, bitten nails pressed against her bottom lip, still in her bathrobe and keeping watch. She reaches down and squeezes his hand. He squeezes back. Between dreams, he catches the sound of muffled voices in the hallway. Nothing, Zara's voice is saying. Not a thing. Nobody is taking our calls. How can they not be taking our calls? I'm the goddamn president. Permission to do a thing, ma'am? Slightly outside diplomatic protocol? A comment. First family has been lying to us, the American people. One. What else are they lying about? A tweet. I knew it, I knew Alex was gay, I told you bitches. A comment. My 12-year-old daughter has been crying all day. She's dreamt of marrying Prince Henry since she was a little girl. She is heartbroken. A comment. Are we really supposed to believe that no federal funds were used to cover this up? A tweet. L-M-A-O, ho, 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 wait, look at page 22 of the emails, Alex is such a ho. A tweet. O-M-F-G, did you see? Somebody who went to uni with Henry posted some photos of him in a party, and he is just like, profoundly gay in them, I'm screaming. A tweet. 
Read my column with at WSJ on what the hashtag Waterloo letters center workings of the Claremont White House. More comments. Slurs. Lies. June takes his phone away and shoves it under a couch cushion. He doesn't bother protesting. Henry's not going to call. At one in the afternoon, for the second time in twelve hours, Zara bursts through his bedroom door. Pack a bag, she says. We're going to London. June helps him stuff a backpack with jeans and a pair of shoes and a broken-in copy of Prisoner of Azkaban and he stumbles into a clean shirt and out of his room. Zara is waiting in the hall with her own bag and a freshly pressed suit of Alex's, a sensible navy one that she has apparently decided is appropriate for meeting the queen. She's told him very little, except that Buckingham Palace has shut down communication channels in and out, and they're just going to show up and demand a meeting. She seems confident Sean will agree to it, and willing to physically overpower him if not. The feeling rolling around in his gut is bizarre. His mom has signed off on them going public with the truth, which is incredible. But there's no reason to expect that from the Crown. He could get marching orders to deny everything. He thinks he might grab Henry and run if it comes down to that. He's almost completely sure Henry wouldn't go along with pretending it was all fake. He trusts Henry, and he believes in him. But they were also supposed to have more time. There's a secluded side entrance of the residence that Alex can sneak out of without being seen, and June and his parents meet him there. I know this is scary, his mom says, but you can handle it. Give him hell, his dad adds. June hugs him, and he shoves on his sunglasses and a hat and jogs out the door. Alex wonders briefly if they volunteered for the assignment, but he's trying to get his emotions back under control, and that's not going to help. He bumps his fist against Cash's as he passes, and Amy nods up from the denim jacket she's needling yellow flowers into. It's all happened so quickly that now, knees curled up to his chin as they leave the ground, is the first time Alex is able to actually think about everything. He's not, he thinks, upset people know. He's always been pretty unapologetic when it came to things like who he dates and what he's into although those were never anything like this. Still, the cocky shithead part of him is slightly pleased to finally have a claim on Henry. Yep, the prince. Most eligible bachelor in the world, British accent, face like a Greek god, legs for days. Mine. But that's only a tiny, tiny fraction of it. The rest is a knot of fear, anger, violation, humiliation, uncertainty panic. There are the flaws everyone's allowed to see. His big mouth, his mercurial temper, his searing impulses. And then there's this. It's like how he only wears his glasses when nobody's around. Nobody's supposed to see how much he needs. He doesn't care that people think about his body and write about his sex life, real or imagined. He cares that they know, in his own private words, What's pumping out of his heart? And Henry. God, Henry. Those emails, those letters, were the one place Henry could say what he was really thinking. There's nothing that wasn't laid out in there. Henry being gay, B going to rehab, the queen tacitly keeping Henry in the closet. Alex hasn't been a good Catholic in a long day. B going to rehab, the queen tacitly keeping Henry in the closet. Alex hasn't been a good Catholic in a long time, but he knows confession is a sacrament. They were supposed to stay safe. Fuck. He can't sit still. He tosses Prisoner of Azkaban aside after four pages. He encounters a thick piece on his own relationship on Twitter and has to shut down the whole app. He paces up and down the aisle of the jet, kicking at the bottom of the seats. Can you please sit down? Zara says after twenty minutes of watching him twitch around the cabin. You're giving my ulcer an ulcer. Are you sure they're going to let us in when we get there? Alex asks her. Like, what if they don't? What if they, like, call the royal guard on us and have us arrested? Can they do that? Amy could probably fight them. Will she get arrested if she tries to fight them? For fucks? 
sake, Zara groans, and she pulls out her phone and starts dialing. Who are you calling? She sighs, holding the phone up to her ear as it rings. Srivastava. What makes you think he'll answer? It's his personal line. Alex stares at her. You have his personal line and you haven't used it until now? Sean, Zara snaps. Listen up, you fuck. We are in the air right now. F. Sotis is with me. ETA, six hours. You will have a car waiting. We will meet the queen and whoever the fuck else we have to meet to hash this shit out. Or so help me God, I will personally make your balls into fucking earrings. I will scorched earth your entire motherfucking life. She pauses, presumably to listen to him agree, because Alex can't imagine him doing anything else. Now, put Henry on the phone and do not try to tell me he's not there because I know you haven't let him out of your sight and she shoves her phone at Alex's face. He takes it uncertainly and lifts it to his ear. Just noise. Hello? It's Henry's voice. Sweet and posh and shaky and confused, and relief knocks the wind out of him. Sweetheart. He hears Henry's exhale over the line. Hi, love. Are you okay? He laughs wetly amazed. Fuck, are you kidding me? I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you okay? I'm managing. Alex winces. How bad is it? Philip broke a vase that belonged to Anne Boleyn. Gran ordered a communications lockdown and mum hasn't spoken to anyone, Henry tells him. But, uh, other than that, all things considered, it's... Uh, I know, Alex says. I'll be there soon. There's another pause. Henry's breath shaking over the receiver. I'm not sorry, he says, that people know. Alex feels his heart climb up into his throat. Henry, he attempts. I, maybe, I talked to my mom. I know the timing isn't ideal. Would you? I won't. Hang on, Alex says. Are we, um, are we both asking the same thing? That depends. Were you going to ask me if I want to tell the truth? Yeah, Alex says, and he thinks his knuckles must be white around the phone. Yeah, I was. Then, yes. A breath, barely. You want that? Henry takes a moment to respond, but his voice is level. I don't know if I would have chosen. Not about this. Not about you. Alex's eyelashes are wet. I fucking love you. I love you too. Just hold on until I get there. We're gonna figure this out. I will. I'm coming. I'll be there soon. Henry exhales a wet, broken laugh. Please do hurry. They hang up, and he passes the phone back to Zara, who takes it wordlessly and tucks it back into her bag. Thank you, Zara. I... She holds up one hand, eyes closed. Don't... Seriously, you didn't have to do that. Look, I'm only going to say this once, and if you ever repeat it, I'll have you kneecapped. She drops her hand fixing him with a glare that manages to be both chilly and fond. I'm rooting for you, okay? Wait, Zara, oh my god, I just realized, you're my friend. No, I'm not. Zara, you're my mean friend. Am not. She yanks a blanket from her pile of belongings, turning her back to Alex and wrapping it around her. Don't speak to me for the next six hours. I deserve a fucking nap. Wait, wait, okay, wait, Alex says. I have one question. She sighs heavily. What? Why do you wait to use Sean's personal number? Because he's my fiancé, asshole. But some of us understand the meaning of discretion, so you wouldn't know about it. She tells him without even so much as looking at him, curled up against the window of the plane. We agreed we'd never use our personal numbers for work contact. Now shut up 
and let me get some sleep before we have to deal with against the window of the plane. We agreed we'd never use our personal numbers for work contact. Now shut up and let me get some sleep before we have to deal with the rest of this. I'm running on nothing but black coffee, a Wetzel's pretzels, and a fistful of B-12. Do not even breathe in my direction. It's not Henry, but B, who answers when Alex knocks on the closed door of the music room on the second floor of Kensington. I told you to stay away, B is saying as soon as the door is open, brandishing a guitar over her shoulder. She drops it as soon as she sees him. Oh, Alex, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Philip. She scoops him up with her free hand into a surprisingly bone-crushing hug. Thank God you're here. I was about to come get you myself. When she releases him, he's finally able to see Henry behind her, slumped on the settee with a bottle of brandy. He smiles at Alex weakly and says, Bit short for a stormtrooper. Alex's laugh comes out half-sob, and it's impossible to know if he moves first or if Henry does. But they meet in the middle of the room, Henry's arms around Alex's neck, swallowing him up. If Henry's voice on the phone was a tether, his body is the gravity that makes it possible his hand gripping the back of Alex's neck a magnetic force, a permanent compass north. I'm sorry, is what comes out of Alex's mouth, miserably, earnestly, muffled against Henry's throat. It's my fault. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Henry releases him, hands on his shoulders, jaw set. Don't you dare. I'm not sorry for a thing. Alex laughs again, incredulous, looking into the heavy circles under Henry's eyes and the chewed-up bottom lip, and for the first time, seeing a man born to lead a nation, Alex says. He leans up and kisses the underside of his jaw, finding it rough from a full, fitful day without a shave. He pushes his nose, his cheek into it, feels some of the tension sap out of Henry's at the touch. You know that? They find their way onto the lush purples and reds of the Persian rugs on the floor. Henry's head in Alex's lap and B on a poof, plucking away at a weird little instrument she tells Alex is called an auto harp. B pulls over a tiny table and sets out crackers and a little chunk of soft cheese and takes away the brandy bottle. From the sound of it, the queen is absolutely livid. Not just to finally have confirmation about Henry, but because it's via something as undignified as a tabloid scandal. Philip drove in from Anmer Hall the minute the news broke and has been rebuffed by B every time he tries to get near Henry for what he says will simply be a stern discussion about the consequences of his actions. Catherine has been by once, three hours ago, stone-faced and sad, to tell Henry that she loves him and he could have told her sooner. And I said, that's great, Mum, but as long as you're letting Gran keep me trapped, it doesn't mean a fucking thing, Henry says. Alex stares down at him, shocked and a little impressed. Henry rests an arm over his face. I feel awful. I was, I don't know, all the times she should have been there the past few years. It caught up to me. B sighs. Maybe it was the kick in the arse she needs. We've been trying to get her to do anything for years since Dad. Still, Henry says, the way Gran is, Mom isn't to blame for that. And she did manage to protect us before. It's not fair. H, B says firmly, looks down at the little buttons of the auto harp. We deserve to have one parent, at least. The corner of her mouth pinches, so much like Henry's. Are you okay? Alex asks her. I know I... I saw a couple articles. He doesn't finish the sentence. The powder princess was the fourth highest Twitter trend ten hours ago. Her frown twitches into a half smile. Me? Honestly, it's almost a relief. I've always said that the most comfortable I could be is everyone knowing my story up front, so I don't have to hear the speculations or lie to cover the truth or explain it. I'd rather it, you know, hadn't been this way, but here we are. At least now I can stop acting as if it's something to be ashamed of. I know the feeling, Henry says softly. 
The quiet ebbs and flows after a while. The London night black and pressing in against the window panes. David the Beagle curls up protectively at Henry's side, and B picks a Bowie song to play. She sings under her breath, I, I will be king, and you, you will be queen. And Alex almost laughs. It feels like how Zara has described hurricane days to him. Stuck together, hoping the sandbags will hold. Henry drifts asleep at some point, and Alex is thankful for it, but he can still feel tension in every part of Henry's body against him. He hasn't slept since the news, B tells him quietly. Alex nods slightly, searching her face. Can I ask you something? Always. I feel like he's not telling me something, Alex whispers. I believe him when he says he's in and he wants to tell everyone the truth, but something? Always. I feel like he's not telling me something, Alex whispers. I believe him when he says he's in and he wants to tell everyone the truth, but there's something else he's not saying. And it's freaking me out that I can't figure out what it is. B looks up, her fingers stilling. Oh, love, she says simply. He misses dad. Oh. He sighs, putting his head in his hands. Of course. Can you explain? He attempts lamely. What that's like? What I can do? She shifts on her poof, repositioning the harp onto the floor and reaches into her sweater. She withdraws a silver coin on a chain, her sobriety chip. Do you mind if I go a bit sponsor? She asks with a smirk. He offers her a weak half smile, and she continues. So, imagine we're all born with a set of feelings. Some are broader or deeper than others, but for everyone, there's that ground floor a bottom crust of the pie. That's the maximum depth of feeling you've ever experienced. And then, the worst thing happens to you. The very worst thing that could have happened. The thing you had nightmares about as a child, and you thought, it's all right because that thing will happen to me when I'm older and wiser, and I'll have felt so many feelings by then that this one worst feeling, the worst possible feeling, won't seem so terrible. But it happens to you when you're young. It happens when your brain isn't even fully done cooking, when you've barely experienced anything, really. The worst thing is one of the first big things that ever happens to you in your life. It happens to you, and it goes all the way down to the bottom of what you know how to feel. And because you were so young, and because it was one of the first things to happen in your life, you will always carry it inside you. Every time something terrible happens to you from then on, it doesn't just stop at the bottom. It goes all the way down. She reaches across the tiny tea table and the sad little pile of water crackers and touches the back of Alex's hand. Do you understand? She asks him, looking right into his eyes. You need to understand this to be with Henry. He is the most loving, nurturing, selfless person you could hope to meet. But there is a sadness and a hurt in him that is tremendous and you may very well never truly understand it, but you need to love it as much as you love the rest of him, because that's him. That is him, part and parcel. And he is prepared to give it all to you, which is far more than I ever in a thousand years thought I would see him do. Alex sits, trying for a long moment to absorb it, and says, I've never... I haven't been through anything like that, he says, voice rough. But I've always felt it, in him. There's this side of him that's unknowable. He takes a breath. But the thing is, jumping off cliffs is kind of my thing. That's the choice. I love him with all that, because of all that, on purpose. I love him on purpose. B smiles gently. Then you'll do fine. Sometime around four in the morning, he climbs into bed behind Henry. Henry, whose spine pokes out in soft points. Henry, who has been through the worst. 
he reaches out a hand and touches the ridge of Henry's shoulder blade, the skin where the sheet has slid off him, where his lungs stubbornly refuse to stop pulling air. Six feet of boy, curled around kicked-in ribs and a recalcitrant heart. Carefully, his chest to Henry's back, he slots himself into place. It's foolishness, Henry, Philip is saying. You're too young to understand. Alex's ears are ringing. They sat down in Henry's kitchen this morning with scones and a note from B that she'd gone to meet with Catherine. And then suddenly, Philip was bursting through the door, suit askew, hair uncombed, shouting at Henry about the nerve to break the communications embargo, to bring Alex here while the palace is being watched, to keep embarrassing the family. Presently, Alex is thinking about breaking his nose with a coffee percolator. I'm twenty-three, Philip, Henry says, audibly struggling to keep his voice even. Mom was barely more than that when she met Dad. Yes, and you think that was a wise decision? Philip says nastily. Marrying a man who spent half our childhoods making films, who never served his country, who got sick and left us and mum? Don't, Philip, Henry says, I swear to God. Just because your obsession with family legacy didn't...